Okay. I call the meeting to order, members, and you will be aware that from 9 p.m. on Wednesday, the 18th of March 2020, the Speaker and Assembly Commission have restricted access to the building to essential business users only. This means that the general public will not be permitted to access the building and the public galleries in the Chamber and committees. Subject to the usual procedures in relation to closed sessions, any public sessions of the committee will continue to be broadcast live for the public to view. Um, whilst this is not ideal, the Speaker and Assembly Commission have taken this decision in the interest of public safety, and procedures will continue to be reviewed on a daily basis. Okay, members. Any apologies then, members? Boris Bradley, Daniel McCrossan. Boris Bradley and Daniel McCrossan. Okay. Yeah. Everyone else is here. Thank you, Clerk. In terms of chairperson's business, then, members, I direct members to tabled items where they will find a revised agenda for today's meeting and suggest to members that the briefing on the 14 to 19 strategy should be deferred and that an oral brief from the Northern Ireland Teaching Council be received in its place today. Members agreed to adopt the revised agenda? Agreed. 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 Thank you. <coughs> Okay, item 2.2 is a letter from the Speaker. I would direct members to tabled items where they will find a letter from the Speaker setting out the access arrangements for Parliament buildings to which I've just referred. Members content to note the letter and agreed? Agreed. 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 Chairperson, also just uh, within that letter, uh, there's a reference to urgent oral questions. So what the Speaker is encouraging ministers to do is rather than having members ask urgent orals, that maybe ministers will come regularly um, to the Assembly and, um, and uh, make statements. So if members uh, think that's the right thing to do, perhaps they might encourage the minister to do the same. I suspect they'll be pushing on open door, um, but uh, if members wish to do that, so Chairperson. Okay. Thank you, Clark. 2.3 members is emergency legislation. Can I advise members that a legislative consent motion on an emergency coronavirus bill may be tabled this week for debate by the Assembly? potentially for next Tuesday consideration. Uh, can I ask members if an LCM is tabled on a bill that contains provisions relating to the Department of Education that the committee would seek to have an additional meeting to be briefed on these provisions prior to the debate taking place? Agreed? Agreed. 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 <coughs> okay. Draft minutes then, members. Could I refer members to the draft minutes of the meeting of the 11th of March 2020 at page 6 and seek members' agreement that the minutes are a complete and accurate recording of proceedings? Agreed? Agreed. Thank you. Agenda item 4 then, members, is matters arising. I have no matters arising. Any other members? <coughs> Jim, just to let you know, I, I indicated to the clerk this morning I have to leave at 12. Uh, Minister, okay. is it? No problem. Okay, members, any other matters arising? No. Okay. okay. Agenda item five then, members, is the ministerial oral briefing uh, on the coronavirus response and, if time permits, the Education Authority internal audit on SAN. Can I refer members to the clerk's covering information on the SAN statementing at page 15? Clerk's covering information on coronavirus response at page 24. Correspondence regarding the Education Authority and SEND statementing it matters is at page 28 to 44, and some responses are in tabled items. And the EA briefing document on statutory assessment audit practice is at page 45. And committee correspondence to the Department of Education regarding coronavirus is setting out a number of questions is at page 51 to 56. Can I welcome? The Minister of Education, the Permanent Secretary. Behind him, he's not far away. Okay. There he is. Excuse me. Let's take a moment, members. Okay, Minister, Permanent Secretary, you're very welcome this morning. Um, by way of welcome, obviously, when we originally invited you to the committee today, it was in response to the very serious issue of the Education Authority audit into the SEND statement in process. Um, 
of course, uh, matters have progressed since then, and we are in the midst of the extremely serious public health challenge relating to COVID-19. I would propose, therefore, that we start with uh, the Department of Education response to coronavirus COVID-19 uh, with presentation from yourselves and questions from the committee, and if time permits, uh, consider uh, the high-level issues relating to the EA audit of the SEND statement in process, perhaps with an intention to return to that matter in a bit more detail, if Sorry, you're content Chair, with that I mean, I, approach. Look, I'm, I'm content with any way that the, the, the committee wishes to, to proceed. Okay. Obviously, I mean, in normal times, there would be genuinely, obviously, the SEN issue is a very critical issue. Absolutely, yeah. Obviously, I think all of us facing fairly unprecedented times, so I appreciate But I'm happy to deal, in terms of the time frame, as, as sure. it develops with, uh, I think your schedule permits you to be here to eleven thirty approximately. Is that right? Yeah. 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 Okay. Just again, I'm in the hands of the committee. Yeah. In okay. To that no problem. Sort of but Minister Permsek, thank you very much indeed for coming to the committee today. Um, you don't need me to tell you that there is a degree of confusion and concern amongst schools and parents across Northern Ireland in relation to coronavirus and COVID nineteen response. Um, I hope. Our committee today can approach that matter with leadership in mind and provide as much clarity um, as we can to the situation. So grateful for your uh, attendance here today, Minister, and invite you to present to the to the committee. Okay. Thank you. Um, thank you to all the committee. Obviously, we're meeting in sort of both very unprecedented times and probably sort of a. a a critical time, um, not just for those of us in Northern Ireland, but throughout the world. Um, uh, you know, I think for all of us, we will have a, a level of concern and worry as to how this will impact uh, on the entire community. I think all of us are looking in our own minds to friends and family, um, and indeed a fear that before we emerge from this, that probably all of us in some shape or form will be touched by this uh, terrible uh, virus. Uh, in terms of the, the approach that we've taken, um, I suppose one of the, the obstacles has tended to be that, and probably continues to be, there's a fluidity of the situation, so that even where advice is able to be passed on, uh, it's not something where, if you like, the department is acting in a silo. We, at times, will be, in terms of even what we can, instructions or information that we can give uh, to schools uh, and other youth settings, um, that we are at times then dependent upon uh, very detailed specialist advice from uh, so the medical experts, in particular the public health agency. There is obviously a uh, desire, particularly on their part, to ensure that anything that is then sent on is, is absolutely 100% accurate, and that level of detail sometimes producing means that, that we're not in a position sometimes to get that information as quickly to schools as, as we would like. Uh, clearly, in terms of the approach that we have taken, um, and I suppose very much the buck stops with me that I've personally taken, is to ensure that any action that is taken, any advice that is given, is entirely compatible with uh, the expert medical and scientific advice, as I've said, uh, as I've said before. Um, my goal throughout this, I, I suppose at, at secondary level, is to ensure, we'll, we'll come on to some of those issues, that the education of our young people is, is continuing to be looked after. I think a range of those practical issues will create sort of um, very big problems at times for the department, but they are all probably overcomable, um, as, and particularly as we move ahead uh, as where we are. Uh, probably the biggest single challenge is obviously the protection of, of public health and public life, and so consequently, uh, all steps have tried to be taken which are compatible with that scientific advice, and again, I think it would be irresponsible to move outside uh, that sphere. Now, having said that, I think we're in a fluid uh, situation. Uh, even as we speak, there is work ongoing by some of the scientific advisory people to reassess and to make sure that what we have is, is fit for purpose. That is therefore likely to be a moving situation, which I suppose may limit the amount that I can say directly um, on some of that. Uh, from that point of view, I've always indicated that uh, I don't have a, a particular doctor in our position which says, you know, this is the right answer, this is the wrong answer. What I have said is I want to be guided entirely by the scientific and, and medical evidence. And I think 
I will not go take us in a direction which is uh, contrary to that. But I think, as I said, we are in a fluid situation. We've seen this week, even in terms of some of the uh, announcements that were made on, on Monday, which will have implications. If we are in a fluid situation, it may well be the basis that uh, if we're looking for uh, further announcements that we can try and wrap up as much together rather than do this on a piecemeal basis. I, I should say, as opposed to maybe on one um, update the committee on one particular aspect, uh, because it's simply arisen this morning. Uh, this morning, the Chief Inspector has written to uh, all schools, and certainly it was something I welcome, confirming that for the rest of this school term there will be no further inspections or visits by the Inspectorate. Uh, and I think, again, that's a very sensible move, and I, I know, I suspect, that many within the, the education settings will, will welcome that. Um, as we move, move forward, obviously, there's a number of contingency issues which need to be looked at. Um, it's clear that we will reach a point uh, at which schools will be closed. So there are a number of implications within that. I should say, I think, we've got to be careful that a narrative is not developed or indeed a misunderstanding that simply saying that schools uh, cease to operate on site means that education stops. That is not the case. And I know that there's been quite a lot of work that's already gone on by schools and in terms of preparation, we've sent out the, the message to them um, no later than, than Monday of this week that they need to be preparing up materials so that when we reach the point at which school closures happen, um, that they are in a position then to carry on with online teaching, have packs for uh, pupils. Uh, it's important that, that uh, in this horrific crisis that the people don't miss out on their education uh, and therefore that that preparation um, is done. Uh, very specifically, uh, also there will be an examination. Again, I hope to move forward on this. You know, one of the major reasons, I think probably the major reason why... Uh, the broad advice has been to, to keep schools open at this stage has been the, the work that is ongoing in terms of, um, you know, th there's, there's different assessments, if you like, of the particular extent and modelling uh, of the spread of the virus, depending upon where children are, uh, you know, whether schools are going. Probably the biggest single factor has been the <laughs> issue of... Um, uh, of the impact, if you like, on uh, what parental response will be needed to this, and obviously the particular concern that uh, that unless something is done uh, which gives levels of, of cover and support, that uh, we would see a denuding of uh, particularly frontline services, emergency services, and particularly in terms of, of health side of it. So there will be ongoing work to establish that even in the event of um, overall school closures, how can we provide some level of cover uh, for those particular set of, of workers? That, some of that will mean then that in terms of provision, for instance, of childcare facilities and child, you know, we may be able to accommodate that in some way and do it in a way which, because the numbers are, are an awful lot smaller than uh, what would be involved in the broader school population, which ensures that we have all the health and safety requirements that will provide the, the protection of social distancing. So that is something which is, is ongoing and will be ramped up in the days ahead. There are also, again, because a lot of these things, as you can probably appreciate, um, and there will be discussions think, as we speak, which the department is being represented up by senior officials, there is across the executive a civil contingencies group which involves all the departments, is chaired by the First and Deputy First Minister, and also involves a number of the key services, you know, for example, the ambulance service, uh, PSNI, etc. Um, so a lot of the work that, that has to be done ultimately is one that, that cuts across different departments. Um, as such, I think one area which we are working on with health and communities, again in the position in which um, uh, we reach a point of uh, there being sort of complete shutdown um, of how we deal particularly the issue of free school meals, the issue of things of Getting a warm meal to those who are vulnerable goes well beyond that of children. It is actually the, of how we provide that support to vulnerable, uh, vulnerable adults. And there has been work that has been ongoing between my officials and other uh, departments on how that can be best um, managed. 
I think one of the things that people do need to realise is that in terms of um, the cost of free school meals, around about two-thirds of that is actually for the payment of the, of the workers. Um, it's less than a pound, I think, for the actual food, because you, you're able to have a volume of scale that would be there. So I know that some people have talked about simply some form of voucher system to, to pay. So I think that wouldn't be particularly practical because it wouldn't, wouldn't cover the money, but that would be dealt with as well on an executive-wide basis, and probably, I think, in terms of the broader area of, of feeding the vulnerable, would probably one where the, the, probably the principal direction of travel will come from the Department of Communities. Uh, in terms of, I suppose, other, other issues that are uh, there, uh, obviously there would be a key concern around examinations. Uh, there's been considerable work, and I think Derek will want to, I suppose, deal with a little bit more detail on that. Um, whether I respond to questions or I'll, I'll team in a minute or two. Um, there's been a good deal of work with CCA on the options in terms of examinations. Obviously, at this stage, the, the, the principal concentration will be on the, the public examinations, particularly GCSE, AS levels, A levels, um, which will then have an impact very directly on, uh, on people's future. Uh, clearly, if it's simply an internal examination, that is something that is obviously far less uh, pressing and will not be of particular significance. Um, we are in a good position in Northern Ireland uh, internally because um, we have a situation in which uh, a lot of work, we, we operate the CCA on a linear model, which means that um, uh, there can be levels of assessment, so that gives us a range of options. The, the preferred option, I think, for all of us is that obviously if we were in a position that schools were operating reasonably normally, or indeed the preferred option across the board in terms of examinations, we'd be exams, we'd be able to be held. But I think there's a realisation that may well not be practical. So there are a range of options that are being developed up uh, from CCA. I think one of the slight limitations that we have um, is that, uh, first of all, there will be sections of our examinations market that uh, lie outside of Northern Ireland, so the, and things are not as easy in England, but also actually that these feed in particularly to uh, examination results and a sort of competitive process, particularly at, at A level for universities um, throughout the United Kingdom and beyond. And so therefore it's critical, I think, CCA are working with the other examination bodies um, and the examinating regulars, regulators and the universities to scope out what options are there, that's something then that can be fairly applicable uh, across the board. Because again, there's no point in, in a range of our pupils getting particular grades if nobody else is, because there wouldn't be any decisions able to be made at university level. But I think Derek has some more, more detail um, on that. Maybe I'll leave to Derek, is there anything else you want to say on the examination side? No, no I'll, I think that's enough at this stage. Happy to okay. pick up questions. Okay, I, look, I'm sure there's probably something of I forgot to, to mention at this stage, but I'm sure they'll be picked up um, <coughs> in terms of questions. Uh, as I said, I would simply reiterate, we are in a somewhat both critical situation but also fluid uh, situation. So I'll try and give answers as best we can. But uh, as with all these things, I think there's a strong possibility of events being um, overtaken um, very quickly in relation to any responses or any questions that we ask. OK. Thank you, Minister. Thank you for having a sec. I I'm uh, acutely aware of the need for us collectively to demonstrate leadership in relation to these issues. I'm aware of my role as chair uh, as a, a statutory committee. I want to take a very brief moment just to um, state that the separate to my role as chair that the Alliance Party position in relation to the issue this week was to propose and support proposals for engagement with stakeholders and the allocation of time to plan for a phased school closure from Friday the 20th of March. Having said that, I will ensure that my position as chair of this committee today is as chair of this committee and seek to ask questions and, and guide questions from the members as well then. Uh, Minister, in, in that regard, um, can, I, can I start by asking if you know how many schools in Northern Ireland are closed today? Look, again, I think it's very good. Sorry, not no. today, because the picture is changing. Okay, okay. We, we can provide that information, and we gather that information on a daily basis. But I could give you a figure today, and it could be wrong in ten minutes' time. Okay. Well, suffice to say, I imagine that we're all aware that it is a reasonably significant number of schools. 
um, which suggests, objectively speaking, that the attempt to enrol schools in your position with regards to um, a call to follow expert clinical advice um, is diminishing. Um, so can I give you another opportunity to explain more fully what that expert clinical advice is and why it, it leads you to call for schools to remain open? Okay, as I said, we're in a moving situation where even the expert medical advice, you know, there is further consideration happening that on a, uh, a wider a wider basis. I suppose what has been grounded upon has been, and there are, I suppose, in terms of the tackling the virus, it has been, um, obviously, the different people have different thoughts and views on how best to do that. Um, I have sought, and indeed, through the executive has, has sought to seek the advice directly of the chief medical officer. That is backed up by the public health agency uh, and on a more global basis by the, sorry, more UK-wide basis on the um, scientific advisory group on um, emergencies. Uh, that advice, I suppose, was and has been uh, that um, and was delineated, I suppose, um, both initially and then on uh, Thursday, whenever the executive had, meet, had met, um, within a few hours of the announcement of the Republic of Ireland, uh, directly by the chief medical officer. His view was that, in terms of interventions, that um, the beneficial impact of any form of school closures could be relatively minimal, and therefore, to some extent, we're down the pecking order of various things that, that uh, should be done but also that this wasn't the right time to do it. What he talked about was that he wanted the, uh, the right interventions at the right time, making the maximum level of impact. I think the very specific concerns that were raised um, were, uh, if you took um, 330,000, well, 340,000 if you include all the, um, the, sort of the preschool children, because I think the other thing has got to be made clear is that when we reach a point, um, leaving aside what can be specifically done for emergency workers, when we talk about school closures, that is also um, sort of code, if you call it, for both youth settings and also childcare facilities. I mean, it's, it's got to be something that's entirely across the board. So we shouldn't just assume that it's, it's a large part of it. But anyway, the principal concern would be that if you take that number of parents out, uh, you take them out quickly, that at a critical time where those particular responses are needed for the virus, that inevitably two things will happen. Uh, the parental childcare arrangements for a large number of those, those pupils, and the vast bulk of them would require some form of childcare arrangements. Those who would be at the upper echelons of school, some of the later teenagers won't require anybody in with them, but particularly younger children certainly will. Uh, that inevitably would lead to an enormous disruption to the health service, to frontline services, and take quite a large number of um, those workers out of the equation just at a time whenever they needed to be there. The other implication, I think, is that, uh, and this predated as well the advice that, that has emerged then on Monday, um, that in practical terms for a lot of parents, a lot of parents who um, for example, would not simply be able to afford for one of them to be at home, no matter what provision is, is, is made, uh, that a lot of that childcare arrangements then would fall upon grandparents. And we know uh, from the point of view of um, what we've detected from the virus in terms of, in terms of the mortality rates, that those who are um, elderly are the most vulnerable um, to this. And the concern, if you like, was that, that whatever benefits you would have from removing children from each other, at least in a school setting, those would be more than offset by the impact at that stage on uh, those two categories. I think there's also, again, one of the things which is not, I think, commonly understood and may well have been given an impression by what at least initially has happened in the Republic of Ireland. It is also the case that the, the medical advice would be that if you were looking at uh, school closures, particularly to isolate children, to, to take them out of the equation, 
this isn't simply a question of, of withdrawing things, and I think even as the Taoiseach said last night, um, you know, you're talking about something that's going to be a very sustained and long-term situation. So if you're going to withdraw, uh, if you're going to withdraw children from school, it will not be on the basis of effectively a, a two-week period and then everything will go back to normal. Uh, realistically, uh, when school closures happen uh, and when children are removed, we are talking about for the rest of, the, the rest of this academic year, which will also then run, as we know, would you run into then the summer holidays? So you're actually talking about until the end of August is a very long period of time. So you know all those factors, I think, uh, led the chief medical officer to a very clear-cut assessment that, that uh, now has not been the right time uh, to do that. Because that's the sort of the, the background on the, the broad sort of scientific quality to that. As I said, a principal concern. Well, obviously, I'm very concerned about the education of our young people. Principal concern is the assessment of the impact on, on public health. You know, at the end of this, I, I want to be able to. I think all of us want to be in a situation where there will be. It is likely to be a horrendous number of deaths arising out of this. We don't know how much is probably wrong to speculate, but there will be large numbers of deaths if we can try and keep those in minimum. Because every every individual death is not simply a statistic. It is the impact that that will have on a on a family. And so, therefore, I think my overriding duty, on the basis of uh, being ensured that, that what is there is compatible with uh, with what I'm told, um, is to try and preserve life. But I mean, like, frankly, there are clearly no easy choices in relation to this, and we are moving in a somewhat fluid environment. Okay, there's a, a couple of things I want to follow up on there, Minister. But first, can I seek clarity with regards to why the closure period will need to be for? 14 to 16 that, weeks. That is the, the, the clinical advice. If essentially um, this will not be a virus which will be eradicated in any very short period of time. If you were, for instance, simply, and I, I know in the Republic of Ireland they announced essentially a two week period, I suspect that that will simply have to be extended because, uh, you know, unless you were left with a situation that you had a fairly um, and I'm maybe dwelling in areas that I wouldn't have, have expertise, but unless you had, at a very early stage of a virus where you had one or two cases and you felt particular action could just eradicate it and you would completely sort of hermetically seal it from the, the future point, I think the clinical advice is that, that like a two-week break isn't really going to do a great deal of good, that if you were to try to genuinely suppress the numbers, it's a much longer period of time. Uh, and so... You know, I've, I've heard talk of three months. I've heard talk of four months. You know, it may even be longer in relation to that. Um, I, I think just the feeling is two weeks, for instance, would simply be a token gesture. Okay. You do, however, of course, say that there will be school closure, and, and it will be for that considerable period of time. You've said that the clinical advice is about uh, deciding on that school closure at the right time. Have you any clear indication as to when that right time is going to be? Well, look, I'll have to rely directly on that scientific advice. Look, I think um, one of the things I would say is that uh, it is clear that the spread um, in terms of the modelling would suggest that things are moving quicker uh, than everybody anticipated. Um, I think that will influence levels of, of timing in relation to it. But it is important we make the right interventions at the right, at the right time. I think part of the thing is to ensure you have the maximum impact, and some of that will also be around the modelling of when we can suppress the spike um, to try to ensure then as well. Because I think part of the issue as well with this is if we are going to be faced with large numbers of cases, I think particularly from the health service point of view, we, as much as possible, we want to try to um, massage things so that they happen at a time when there's, there's the least pressure on the health service. I think if we were facing a situation, which is not impossible, this could happen, and one of the things we need to guard against, that if, for example, the, the peak point uh, of any virus outbreak happens during the winter periods, that effectively the, the health service will, will fall over. Um, the issue, I suppose, particularly in terms of the potential mortality rate, uh, is not simply as well on the basis of those who die from the virus. But if the, the hospitals are so overwhelmed within that, it will help inevitably have a pretty large knock-on effect on other mortalities. So it will mean that patients will not be able to be treated 
uh, as quickly. Parents, patients, even with serious conditions, will not be able to get a bed. Um, you know, essentially, there will be people, um, and I think there's a danger of this in, in whatever stage we, we peak, but it's particularly if, if, if the peak is, reaches a wrong period, um, that uh, there are also quite a large number of secondary deaths, things that, that under normal circumstances would be able to be treated, would be able to be cured. I mean, we talk, um, you know, there's talk quite often in, in the medical profession, particularly around heart attacks, of the, uh, you know, the golden period at the start, and if you don't get that intervention very quickly, uh, that will lead to deaths. I, I think inevitably, if, if, uh, and I think this will happen to some extent, no matter when things happen, uh, but we want to keep that to a minimum as well. Okay. I suppose at, at this stage of the escalation of UK advice with regards to flattening the curve and with regards to general population working from home and socially distancing where possible, but for at-risk groups, mm -hmm. even clearer advice is to socially isolate. Um, can you understand why teachers, parents expect that it ought to be possible to give a clear answer to what that time for closure will be? Yeah, look, I think that's something that uh, there are ongoing discussions on, I think, particularly with the chief medical officers, uh, with scientific group, which also then feed directly into government. No, look, I understand the frustration. I think the, the problem is that whatever you're doing has got to be entirely condition-led, and therefore um, it's, you know, I think the more precision that can be given, the better. Uh, and I think that uh, where there will be further movement must be on the basis of giving that very clear understanding to people uh, and trying as much as possible to have an overall package of, of, of information. I suppose sometimes trying to get all those aligned to be able to give that is, is sometimes can be difficult. Uh, but certainly as we move ahead, you know, it's a fluid situation. I, I would hope to see um, something which can give a greater level of certainty. I, I entirely understand the frustration. And, you know, the frustration is obviously out there for, and faced by all of us as well. Um, it's allied very much with the concern that is there, because this is not a situation where there's just some sort of flu ep epidemic and people are facing being a little bit sick. You know, we're talking about something that is very deadly, to which there is no, there is no cure. Um, fortunately, I think for the vast bulk of people who, who will suffer from this, the, the condition will be relatively mild. But for some variants, there are variations in terms of the estimates of this. But for some, this will be a fatal condition. Um, and that is very scary for everybody. I think it's scary, to be honest, it'd be scary for me type of thing in terms of looking to society. And I think it's scary for, for all of us. So, you know, I think the concerns out there are absolutely understandable. I, I completely appreciate that. OK, so let, let's focus on responding to those concerns then. In, in addition to the, the escalation of the UK advice um, affecting concerns around timing, as I said, the advice is for general population to work from home and to socially distant where possible and for mm -hmm. at-risk groups to socially isolate. You appreciate that within that, at, that within the school population there are many people that are in those at-risk categories, mm -hmm. I think particularly with regard to special school provision, mm -hmm. um, but across uh, the school system. What, what has been and what is your guidance for people within schools that are in the at-risk category that the government has directed to socially isolate that are being required to attend our schools? Today? Well, certainly I think there's nothing that we would say that would be incompatible with that, and I bear that in mind. I mentioned, Chair, um, that there's a, a fluid situation I think there will be we've been working as well with PHA on very specific advice um, we're in a fluid situation I would hope to see a situation in which there can be um, there can be wider agreement wider announcements in terms of uh, the way forward in relation to this and I think uh, it's important that uh, that everything is then brought together within that that, that position Okay, you meant, I think members will want to probably press you on some of those questions, but you, you mentioned the significance of having childcare arrangements in place, particularly for key health staff. What engagement have you had with the childcare sac sector and what well, plans are being put in place to 
provide that care? Where, where, I, think, where I think we're looking at in relation to this um, is to look at, I think, while obviously the principal focus will be on, on healthcare, there will be other sectors out there that will require um, some level of protection, uh, you know, go beyond that. I think one of the areas that will need to be scoped out, and may well be getting scoped out at the moment, is if we move to a situation of that nature, um, what, uh, you know, sort of which other sort of key workers will this, will this cover? I think that's one of the things that will be raised at the Civil Contingencies Group to, to try and get some level of assessment from departments. I think we need to assess the numbers that are there. Um, we need to assess then also as part of that the willingness of, um, of parents to do that because if, if you had a sort of eligibility requirement, there would be some parents will say, well, actually, to, to help facilitate me remaining at work as a nurse or a doctor, an ambulance driver, I think this is a, a key thing that I want to take advantage of. Others may say, well, actually, I have my own arrangements. Doesn't need to, to do that. Or alternatively say, well, actually, I still would prefer something, something at home. Um, I suppose part of the issue with that, when I'm talking about childcare, I'm not simply talking about what could be provided for basically the preschool uh, cohort. I think we'll be examining um, to what extent this can be uh, extended. Whenever I'm talking about childcare, I'm also talking about perhaps particular teaching arrangements for some children as well. So it's, it's about sort of a mix uh, within that. Um, those are still, there's, a, there's enormous logistical difficulties, and one of the issues, I suppose, with that. Uh, it is difficult until we get a degree of handle on what numbers we're going to be talking about. Uh, we can then start modelling how we provide that, that provision, um, but that's not something that will happen overnight in that regard. I'm keen, I'm sorry, Prime Secretary. Yep. Chair, Chair, I wonder would the committee find it helpful if I just give a brief overview of what's going on in the department? Mm -hmm. You mean the Minister has dealt with a number of high level policy issues, but just to update the committee okay. uh, before, before questioning? Go ahead. And maybe it will prompt questions. From a departmental perspective, like all government departments, this is now the single issue, and obviously we've invoked our emergency response arrangements. The way that will probably manifest itself to the committee and other stakeholders is that the day job will cease and a lot of routine business, nonetheless important business, will stop and maybe the committee will feel the cold wind of that but we will simply be stopping lots of work to create capacity and resource to deal with some of the issues that the committee is concerned about. So for example, the committee has been briefed on transformation projects. We're just going to suspend those and use the teams to do other work. The bringing forward, for example, of development proposals, really important, high profile. We have good people working in those. They need to be helping us here. And in terms of the big ticket issues, the committee is well aware of them. The minister has mentioned them. From an education perspective, as opposed to a wider public health, there are probably five big ticket issues that are concerning us and we have been working on. Examinations have been mentioned, um, particularly the public examinations, GCSE and A-levels. Now, the Council for the Curriculum Examinations and Assessments, SIA, has been working in great detail on scenario planning and how its contingency plans measure against different scenarios right across the spectrum. Um, they do have robust contingency plans in place to deal with disruption, even major disruption to examinations. But we could be moving to something way beyond that. And as the minister has said, they will need to work with the four other UK or the three other UK bodies and indeed their counterparts in the Republic of Ireland. We do have an advantage in that most of the examinations, 97% at GCSE level, are SIA examinations and within our own control. About 15% at A level are uh, from English or Great Britain awarding bodies. Um, but we're looking at all contingencies there. Got to declare an interest here. The message is pupils need to prepare as normal, and I have a 16-year-old whom I don't want to put the books down just yet, so they need to keep working on that. But you could look at a scenario, ultimately, when the whole timetable moves to the right, and we could accommodate that, and then you have to engage with the university sector and the further education sector to change the whole admissions arrangement. That is all doable but it's uncomfortable. 
The second big ticket issue the Minister has mentioned is the welfare of children and school meals. But this becomes a wider societal issue. The Minister later today will be getting proposals on options for dealing with that. As we speak, we are engaging with the Department for Communities, the Department of Health, and there are options about mobilising the voluntary and community sectors, which are well organised, to help with the logistical arrangements for getting meals to children, bearing in mind we can't bring lots of children into school settings where school meals are currently delivered, but there are other ways of doing that. And you could look at distribution of funding or vouchers so that people can buy meals and various combinations of that. But it is a huge logistical problem. Another issue is the welfare of children generally. Bear in mind we have in the school system many vulnerable children, at-risk children, and for many of them, their main touch point with the system is going to school. And we need to make sure that if schools are closed and they're not coming to school, that those children don't fall through the net. And we're talking to the Department of Health, and it's mainly on the social care side, that those arrangements will be in place. A specific example that was raised with us by a school leader um, on Friday is what if a post-primary pupil is going through a process of school counselling and there is a programme of counselling? We don't want that to be lost. So it's the general welfare of young people. Fourth issue is distance learning and keeping learning going as well as possible. And schools are doing a super job, and I've seen some of the guidance going out, and they are preparing to support distance learning. Be that online, and there are some packages, and EA are trying to ensure that there is capacity in the system, although C2K was not built for this, but there are other packages, Google Classroom, and indeed hard packs going out to pupils. But this will be an ongoing thing. And the final issue is the childcare issue. Now, that is difficult, and as we speak, we are talking to colleagues in the third sector, and we're talking to the Department of Health, seeing how we might be able to provide support to critical workers for the wider economy, and particularly the health and social care sector. So we have teams working on all of these issues as we speak. They're working really, really hard, night and day, weekends. They were working all day yesterday. They're tired, but they're bringing forward potential solutions to ministers. Now, the point that I would make in all of this to the committee, there is no good outcome here. There is no elegant outcome here. There is no positive outcome here. We are in the business of mitigations and least worst outcomes, and everybody needs to realise that. Closing schools does not produce a good outcome for teaching and learning. But we're talking about mitigations as best we can, and we will welcome any ideas and any potential solutions that the committee can bring forward on those issues, because we are in unprecedented times and we are developing potential solutions that have never, ever been applied before. So we're in new territory. That's just a bit of context from the department's perspective, Chair. Appreciate that update and appreciate the extent of work that is initiated refer and acknowledge to the modelling that um, has been considered in terms of timing of, of school closure, but in my close of my initial remarks, schools are now closed. Mm -hmm. Childcare is now needed. The modelling to avoid contact with grandparents and sustain access to work for critical workers is now needed. So there is an extreme urgency for full clarity on all these matters. I'll bring in other members. Uh, Catherine Kelly. Uh, thank you for being here today. Um, Minister, I believe that you're contradicting yourself in your earlier remarks when you mentioned um, that there may be a large number of deaths as a result of this virus, but today children are told to go to school. The safety of our children at this time is paramount. It's health before education. and. There, when you talk about classrooms, most classrooms across the north have 35 children at least within their classes in a small classroom with possibly two staff at least. How can social distancing be um, accomplished or practised within an environment such as that? Um, and a few other questions as well, if you want to answer them afterwards. Or okay, no, I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll take each of them as they, they come in relation to that. Look, I understand, I think, uh, one of the issues, particularly rising up Monday, will be a high level of confusion 
when it comes to the issue of social distancing that has been um, raised centrally. Public, you're, you know, I completely agree with you, which is why decisions have been taken, that they've been taken, that health, uh, you know, important, while I think all of us accept that education is, health comes as the absolute number one priority. Um, the indications given to the Chief Medical Officer and indeed the wider advice is that this is the route which actually preserves the most lives. It is the, the best model. That if you're going to reach a point at which schools get closed, they get closed at the right time. Um, and from that point of view, I can take out of that professional advice and the executive can take that professional advice, and that's the position that the executive as a whole has, has taken, uh, or we can ignore it. Now, that advice, because of changing circumstances, you know, will move on in terms of time. I, I don't have a doctor in our position which says I, I want to keep schools open, um, you know, full stop in that regard. It's about actually following that advice, and if that advice changes, I'll be more than happy to, to alter that. But you're right. Look, I, I'm doing this on the basis of the professional advice of what is best in terms of the overall health uh, of everybody in that in that regard. So it's it is taken very seriously in that regard, Catherine. Um, what risk assessments, if any, have been carried out across schools to ensure health and safety at well, this time? I know a number of schools have done risk assessments. This is part of the overall position, though, of the uh, in terms of the, the health advice uh, that is there. Look, I think uh, I think one of the permanent secretary put it very well. There is no uh, there is no either perfect solution or indeed good or ideal solution. This is about mitigating. It's about trying to ensure that the overall picture results in the, uh, the best possible consequences for public health, or perhaps you should say maybe in current circumstances, the least worst in that regard. So that, that is where we've been, we've been coming from in relation to that. Um, do, does the department hold a list of staff who have underlying health issues, and how have they been communicated with? We're not the employers in that, in that regard. Um, and so, therefore, ultimately, employers, I mean, I'm not quite sure whether they necessarily hold a list, because, again, if you're talking about underlying health conditions, obviously, uh, it will make clear the, the direction of travel of what has been, been said. Uh, I suppose it's also a question, different people will have different health problems as to whether or not then they fit those particular categories and reach that particular, particular level. But we're not the employers, so we don't have a, a full list in terms of the staff side of it. It's, not, it's, it's outside our remit in that regard. Well, just another issue to raise, sorry, Chair. Um, education Authority bus drivers um, in Fermanagh and Oma, where I live, um, there's at least 200 of them. Um, half of the bus drivers are men and women over 65. Mm -hmm. They're in a high, the high risk category. They are driving sometimes 55 children um, three or four hours a day um, across Fermanagh and Oma. Will there be anything, any advice? Um, well, there, the look, there will be. There will be as part of. I think part of the aim of this and working with PHA, working across the, the wider piece, uh, is to try and very soon have something which uh, actually gives a clearer picture right across all the issues on that basis. And clearly, that is one of the one of the key concerns in relation. But I suppose rather than ideally try to do something piecemeal, I want to try and bring that together very quickly uh, across the board. Thank you. Thanks, Catherine. Minister, um, as a, I had asked earlier, there are people within the school system who are in the, an at-risk group that have been directed to socially isolate. Uh, do you, you echo that guidance for them to socially isolate, and have you any assessment of what that social isolation impact is on our school? I, I mean, we're, we're receiving communication that there are schools with multiple teaching and non-teaching staff that have been directed to socially no, I isolate? And, and look, have you any assessment of from, what impact that has had well, look, on obviously the Obviously, there's a fairly significant impact. In answer to your first question of, um, yes, clearly I do support the advice that has been given. Consistently throughout this, I've said that we need to be guided by mm. the direct medical advice, and so therefore I'm not going to pick and choose, if you like, which bits... Uh, which bit it would say except that will itself have a major impact in terms of the ability to deliver education and will factor into the uh, wider position which hopefully will become clearer soon. 
De Deputy Chair, or Permanent Secretary, did you want to come in there? No, no, no. Okay, no, no, Deputy no. Chair, Karen Mull. Thank okay. you, Minister and Permanent Secretary, for coming in today um, what, and what is very challenging times. And um, I know the work that you have been putting in and the Department um, are working very, very hard. And thank you for the update. Uh, we are here all to work together mm. on this. Um, and it is our responsibility to do what is best. I won't go over, we are short in time, what I went over Monday. Peter, I have reached out to you, you know our position. I have also submitted a list of questions um, and we'll add to them uh, as we go along. But there is a few things that I want to pick up on. Um, uh, I, I suppose I've listened to yourself over the last number of days and here this morning. Um, is the executive approach a workforce issue and not a health issue? Because we seem to be talking around we have to prepare, we have to keep children in school to allow uh, frontline staff to still go to work. Well, when talk, Catherine there says about contradiction and putting, sir, sir, we must be putting our frontline staff in danger when we have all these children who are you know, at school, then coming home to their parents or family members um, and then going in. But we seem to keep coming back to, you know, it, it, health as a priority, but we keep coming back to workforce issue. And then that's back to some of the questions that has already been raised. What directive is the department given to school staff and children with a medical condition, those who are uh, uh, pregnant? those who fall under the category who should be socially isolated, because Boris Johnson has been clear over the last two, two days. Oh, and the, oh, sorry. No, no sorry. Go yeah, no, I suppose just to answer those, arguably, I suppose two interrelated questions. No, I think the focus, uh, if I can sort of say, I know there are differences of opinion, certainly particularly on the aspect of uh, the school closure side of things. There are differences of opinion genuinely held from within the executive. However, I think on the bulk of issues, there's probably a levels of consensus around some of the others. Look, I think the driver for people coming on, on any angle of this is health in that regard. It, it just, it's the fact that, and the concern I think that particularly was raised by the Chief Medical Officer, that if we move to a situation in which uh, you take particularly the children of, of healthcare workers out of the system, that will have a very detrimental impact on the, the provision that health can make. Which is why moving ahead, that when we reach the situation in which school closures do happen um, officially, and I appreciate that there's a lot of schools have closed, uh, that there will need to be, and we're working on special provision to have some level of, of catering of, a, uh, of uh, support um, and care for those who are children of healthcare workers who want to avail of it uh, on that basis. So. I think that's that's critical uh, as well. So, in the second point, sorry, I'm uh, has there been direct direct? Oh, yeah. Sorry, in terms uh, of the specific. Yeah. <coughs> well, look, we've been working again. I want to see if this can be wrapped up in a, a wider package. But we've been working with the public health agency, who've been drafting advice. You know, it is fairly clear uh, that what we would be saying to people will be compatible with what has been announced on Monday. So, if you're, for instance, a pregnant school teacher, uh, it's clear uh, that the advice is uh, that. Uh, that sort of you, or indeed, a pregnant student as well. Uh, that the advice is they should be self-isolating, so therefore school should not be the place. And similarly, with a range of vulnerable, uh, vulnerable groups and staff. Obviously, there's a little bit of work to be done, just uh, because it was simply referenced to uh, vulnerable conditions. PHA are obviously working then to provide that a clearer definition. And I think if we take, for instance, on the issue of uh, pregnancy, as I understand it, is uh, it's. The particular risk is really at, at the time of the third trimester, but I think any advice would be, as has been indicated, would be simply to be anyone who is pregnant. I think, again, if there is no really precautious uh, caution approach, we should be taking that where that is compatible with the, the medical advice. So if we are putting people's health first, we need a clear directive coming from the department in relation to protecting staff and children yeah, uh, and who are pregnant mm -hmm. and with no, I, I understand. And I, Catherine's I, point on, on no. bus drivers who are on buses today. I, I understand that. And, and Catherine, we have been, we've been working. Um, over myself, the permanent secretary, and others from the department, and working, to be fair, with, with an awful lot of work that's been produced from health officials as well. We've been working with them, not simply throughout this period, but to take an example, particularly since Monday night, we've been working over St. Patrick's Day with them. There is guidance, I think, being produced by, by PHA. Uh, you know, rightly, they want to ensure that, that everything they have on that is completely right. 
but I think it's also important that if there's a wider package of, of measures, that can also be included as, as, as part of that as well. But we will certainly be very clear uh, with schools on that issue. As teachers and parents at the moment feel that they're being given different advice <coughs> and uh, they're being told to go to work and to go in the classrooms. We talk about the PHA in terms of Catherine raised it and social distancing. It's not possible within a classroom to social, socially distance yourself from children. And then some of the directive that has been given in relation to putting children in the rooms on their own if it's suspected. Um, uh, you know, how do you do that with a four or five year old? I heard last week from special school teachers who don't have a room, don't even have a cupboard to put children in. And I understand that you are working your way through this, but um, you talked about people being frustrated. It's more than frustration, it's real worry and concern. They're listening to the Prime Minister coming on, giving announcements to the nation the last two nights, um, uh, and the Taoiseach in, in the 26 counties given as well. And we seem to be giving conflicting information to schools here in the north. Um, we just want to go back in terms of the, the the social distancing in schools advice. There's a school in my city, um, and I think you would have seen this, Peter, um, has been has a suspected case and has been told they remain open. So what's the directive there for schools? In okay, that? well, look, I'm, I'm not worried the individual case. We can no. certainly pursue it up directly after. after what is the directive for if a school has a suspected case, should they close? I think sort of it should. We take advice yeah. from the public health agency right. on that. So I mean, I don't want to get into right. specifics. No. Yes, yeah. I don't know what the circumstances are. Well, is not, it a positive case? School? Is it a is it a suspected case? It's suspected. Yeah, we take advice from right. the public health agency. If it's a positive case, should, well then the public health agency will advise as well. Right. That, and we'll take a decision with the education authority and the managing authorities on individual schools. Right. And schools are applying for, you, you know, uh, closures and exceptional closures and they will all be looked at on their yeah. merits on the basis of the individual cases. Yeah, and um, would you know how many schools have applied for training days to close? Um, I, don't, I don't have it as of today. It so will it probably be different today than it was yesterday and, or the day before. And clearly, and clearly however, which, however we move precisely forward, uh, as we move towards the point at which there's school closures, obviously there will be need. I think a lot of schools have availed of the opportunity to uh, do sort of specific preparation. A lot of schools are well ahead. They'll also want to be um, in whatever format is, is moved forward, some level of opportunity then for schools that haven't done that as well to be able to be able to avail of some degree of time as we move forward. That would be part of a wider uh, wider position, I think, which you hope to develop. Yeah. If Board of Governors take a decision to go ahead in schools, will there be closed schools? Will there be any repercussions? Well, Board of Governors don't have... Uh, it, the right will lie doesn't lie with, directly with the Board of Governors, and we'll also be in a situation where, across the board in terms of legislation, you know, there will be a range of things, and I think um, across government there will be actually greater uh, powers being given actually to be able to be able to direct things. That will, you know, I think the other thing, we've, we've all got to have a level of flexibility as we move ahead in relation to this as well, which will mean both in terms of flexibility of response, but across the broad public sector, um, I suppose in microcosm, if you like, of the Department of Education, where we have taken um, quite a number of our staff and redirected them to those very specific aspects, depending upon how circumstances work out, I think there will be a lot of workers um, that um, you know will need to be in, in different ways redeployed to be able to provide assistance where it's, where it's needed on that, on that basis. Yeah, can I, Minister, can I just check? Do you have the legal power to close schools? We. Well, let me put this way. I think, strictly speaking, if if there was a, I think a directive given, I think we don't actually, we we could. The department could issue directions yeah. to schools to do basically anything. But as you are probably aware, there is a coronavirus bill mm -hmm. with a wide range of emergency powers, probably going to be enacted in Westminster very soon which will give government wide powers across all sectors, including the education sector, to issue directives to do just about anything, depending on what the contingency is. But just to pick up Ms Mullins' point there, you know, repercussions for schools. You know, we're in extraordinary times. Yeah. School boards of governors and school leaders act in good faith. Mm -hmm. We know that. Yeah. They are very responsible, concerned individuals and we are going to be pragmatic with them. Now, we can't envisage each and every circumstance, but we are not going to 
um, take a non-pragmatic approach to this and get into conflict with school boards of governors and school leaders on this issue. That's my view mm -hmm. as a permanent secretary, and maybe I'm speaking uh, out of turn with the minister. But you know, this is not the time to be running up against people who are doing a very difficult job at the cold face in difficult circumstances, and I understand that. Okay. So you can read yeah. into that what you want. And could also it's it's as a main question that has been asked well, of myself, I have to say. You know, I mean, it's the one you can, you know, I know there's colleagues sitting behind me here from the mm. teaching unions, and they can read into that what they want yeah. to. I think, I mean, yeah. it's also in terms of the bill that's, that's going through across the executive as a whole. Uh, obviously, the normal format of a, of a bill will be that sometimes uh, there will be particular clauses that apply to Northern Ireland, some that don't, some apply to Scotland, etc. Uh, at least in terms of the opportunity for, and it would then be, if you like, could be triggered in Northern Ireland, uh, anything which I think across all departments have been asked for to be in the bill and be have the opportunity to be applicable to Northern Ireland um, have been accepted. So I think the full executive position has been accepted uh, from by legislative of council and by government there. That doesn't mean in a range of things necessarily that things will be done, but it means that if something needs to be done, there will not be the uh, the want of authority to be able to do it as, as we move ahead. Yeah, for example, I give you a specific. I don't want to labour the point, but the kinds of powers. If if you needed to be to do something drastic to move examination centres around to facilitate GCS, GCSEs and A levels, and maybe pupils doing exams in different locations, we would have the power to direct that to happen. Yeah. It's, it's just to cover every conceivable contingency. Mm -hmm. Just finally, um, uh, youth centres and childcare settings are saying they're not receiving clear guidance or advice. And I know this is moving by the hour, not even by the day, but just they've contacted as well. If we could get that out. On, on Monday, uh, Minister Wade raised with the, the query around EA staff directive knocking on the schools. Um, uh, and I know that staff are being directed in other areas. Is that, as has the department? Um, also directed their staff not to go, to go on the schools. So is there a separate arrangement for well, school? Well, first staff? of all, as we speak, and um, well, probably the meeting is over now. You know, there's work going on about civil service staff across the board, what to do and what not to do, and it's sort of in the same vein as some of the advice and guidance to teaching and non-teaching staff in the wider education sector. So hopefully, that guide, advice will be consolidated. But there is no directive, as we stand, about Department of Education staff going into schools or engaging with schools. Now, that said, I've already explained that we're, we're withdrawing from all non-essential work, and that might mean that we're not going near schools. And as the minister mentioned earlier, we have stood down with immediate effect all school inspections. Yeah. However, inspection staff, district inspectors who are out there in the communities um, whilst they will not now be doing inspections, they are more than happy to engage with schools to assist them in the work that they are doing to prepare for distance learning and indeed share good practice across schools, what's happening in one district, what might be applied in another. So we will redeploy them and the full inspectorate will be redeployed to see where it can add value in dealing with all the contingencies that arise, uh, wherever that might be. It's another resource that has been freed up. Thank you. Thanks, Chair. Robbie Butler. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'm sure you would join me in, in thanking all of our teachers genuinely for, for, for working in very and indeed Robbie, all of our all of our system. staff throughout the education yeah. system because I suppose I, I, I know obviously some of the teacher unions are, are behind me. Um, I, yeah, I thank very much the work that teachers principals have done. Obviously that extends to all those who worked um, both in schools, youth settings, childcare settings, a range of so it's important as we don't. Yeah, uh, we don't I'm, sort of ignore anybody. In that I think I'm certainly and I have to declare an interest as, as being on the board of governors in a, in a school in this point that very often our teachers and board of governors almost have to carry the role of a, a mini politician with regard to the interface with concerned parents, other stakeholders, other agencies, and the impact that all of these things have. Um, and uh, not to to steal anybody else's phrase, but we are in uncharted territories, and I have sympathy with absolutely everybody and everybody's point of view. And I think the, the reality is that there are no experts in this. The PHA are doing their best, the Chief Medical Officer is doing their best, the, the Minister for Health is doing their best, you're doing your best, and the Minister for the Economy. I actually think 
our uh, First and Deputy First Minister are also doing their best, because the reality is every one of us have children, relatives, who will and are affected. And I think this is the moment where genuinely this, 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 we have to come together. And I think we are genuinely getting there. So thank you for, for coming here. And I don't envy the position. You couldn't be paid enough to, to do and make the decisions that you're making. Um, and I don't think uh, the line of questions so far by the committee has been, has been constructive, I think. And I think we're moving very rapidly uh, to the point where some people perhaps know that we're going. But what I would like to, to put on record uh, is thanks for some of the information you've given us today, which I think possibly has been missed. And it's not that it hasn't been there. Sometimes it's accessing the information is the hard bit and no more to, to find it. Because I think the reality is um, that about 12 per cent uh, of our population is children in primary schools. And you've already touched on it, Minister, with regard to the conditions uh, that when you take them out of school, it, which will have an effect. Um, and not to labour too far, and I will get to a question. I, I, I've said this before, I was once a firefighter. My wife was a nurse. We had two kids who were in primary school age, and the reality w was different then if schools had a close, because coronavirus changes the, the, the plan things because of where they can go. Uh, Minister, my, my question is, Sanders in and around the executive's approach as opposed to your own approach. And you did talk about uh, civil contingency groups with regard to establishing suitable child mining provision. I think that's going to be absolutely crucial. And I think that's why the, this emergency planning and staged approach is absolutely vital, that we don't crush other sectors of our society. Um, whether that's fiscal or social. So the first question is with regard to the direction that the executive group are taking with this. Do you have um, confidence um, that the relevant departmental leads are bringing the, the information with regard to that? It's a wider than education, I get that. You are uh, our Minister for Education, have a voice in there. Um, that that is receiving enough attention. And the reason I'm asking that is because we do have, whilst coronavirus is incredibly important, we have cancer patients, we have uh, people who are suffering from cystic fibrosis, we have people who are requiring urgent surgical attention, um, we have a, a wider uh, societal wheel that needs to keep turning, which is need going to be underpinned because those people are going to need suitable measures for, for, for not only looking after their children but protecting their children. So in terms of the executive's approach to that, would you be satisfied? Well, look, look I think the executive, done? again, while there may be some difference of opinion, I think there's, a, there's clear work going on to try and pull all that together. I suppose from the point of view of, so there's no confusion on the, the subject, uh, you know, we're looking at what can then be provided in terms of those emergency um, workers. Uh, I think there are a range of, of actions. There's a little logistical work that will need to be done. I suppose very specifically, I mentioned the Civil Contingency Group as probably being the best vehicle for this. Part of that will be establishing um, which group of workers this applies to. Now, there are obviously a wide range of, of frontline hospital staff um, who are key to, to getting that element of things, but there are other things, and I think the aim will be to try to get each department to identify that. The Civil Contingencies Group um, met, I think, for the first time last week. It is meeting literally as we speak. Uh, now, if, had I not been, uh, Derek and myself not been here, we'd have been at it, but there are senior officials from the Department of Education uh, who will be there. And that will contain not simply the department, but also certain the departments, but a few arm's length bodies as well that would be particularly relevant. I think part of the aspect is it is pretty obvious you can identify a range of groups who they should obviously apply to. Are there other groups that, were, that are not being thought of? We need to make sure that we've got a holistic picture. I think there will then need to be a level of exercise done to establish, um, if you like, from the point of view of parents, who would have um, applicable children in that regard, because you know, not everybody clearly in uh, in that emergency situation, or you know, take yourself as an example, had you been a few years ago, this would have applied to you, it doesn't apply now, and also then establish then if there is a level of demand, what that level of demand will be, and that will then sort of be tailored. And I think civil community group, is, I suppose, is the one particular aspect would be to send the message out to, to the departments of can you identify which particular groups uh, that, are, that are there. Mm -hmm. no, no, thank you for that. I think it's really important. There's one, I mean, the information is, is arriving almost. At, by, by the time we go out of here, something yeah. will yeah, I mean, I, I, I mean, obviously, 
yeah, that's right. I mean, there may well be some developments that, that all of us are just sitting here. We're not. And, uh, just un about. unfortunately, that and, and when, when Boris gave a speech the other night, almost instantly businesses, some businesses closed, and certainly in the Wynlagan Valley and Lisbon, some um, nursery provision and some daycare centres either are on the verge of turning the key to close their doors or are, are certainly thinking, and there's some huge investment that some people have made in that, and I think in that civil contingency part, that, that's a piece of the part of the jigsaw, I think, it perhaps is. for, um, um, and I'm, I'm keen to point out that we all recognise that teachers aren't childminders, that they play a, a different function. Um, with, there was, there was uh, a bit of information that was shared earlier with regard to food poverty and, and, the, and the, the and you touched on the counselling piece, and I think I'm just interested to know, in terms of the, we've been talking a lot about mental health, and the reality is that social isolation, yeah. uh, one, yeah. of the, yeah. one of the most significant um, negative but unintended consequences, mm. is going to be perhaps a spike in an already um, drenched atmosphere of poor mental health across uh, Northern Ireland. And this has a, uh, we have to think about this. Um, has there been any thought with regard to not just the counselling piece, but also the contact piece even? Yeah, um, I mean, the, the, might... the, there has been some thought and some work on going on. I mean, I think part of the stuff is, and again, look, I think part of the stuff when we talked about as well, there's no, we're trying to mitigate, but there's no ideal solution. I think probably sometimes you're trying to solve things that sometimes will take you in different directions. And so part of stuff is you want to have as little contact as possible, but then you try to guess. Now, there are very major problems beyond simply the education piece. Yeah. There will be very major problems out there um, because of the need for levels of isolation. You know, I, I know the police have expressed concern that while, if you like, if, if the streets are empty, there may be less sort of on-street crime type uh, situation. But there's a real danger that we're going to see domestic violence go through the roof. Um, families as well that are, are closely confined with each other will be, and that will produce threats for, for children as well. And a whole range of, of issues. I mean, you're right in terms of social isolation. Um, I suppose looking at the other end of the spectrum in that, in that basis. Uh, can I, can oh, I just add, I mean, it, it brings us back to this point that there's no good outcome to no. schools closing. Uh, young people going to school every day, apart from the benefits of learning, it's the social contact, yeah. it's the friendship, it's the extracurricular activities that schools do a fantastic job in, it's the sport, the music, the art, everything that goes on in school trips, that will stop. And there is no way around that if we're talking about isolation. And that will be lost. And that's a, that's a real worry. But you know what? For the life of me sitting here right now, I can't see a sensible mitigation to that right now if we're into major social, social, social isolation. And as a society, we're just going to have to deal with that somehow, and it is a real worry. So I'm afraid that sounds like a bit of a counsel of despair, but it's one of the really negative consequences I mean, if, of schools. If, if you take a look, which also then will have some level of impact, particularly on, on children as well, if you take a look, for instance, at the social isolation that the elderly will face, many of whom will be in a situation where effectively they're sort of confined to their homes and in a situation where deprived probably of their families in that, in that regard. Now, if you take a look, that is obviously the major impact from a social isolation point of view for the elderly. If you look at it the other way from the point of view of children who may have a very close relationship with their grandparents mm -hmm. but are actually more or less uh, kept, um, not even so much at arm's length, even well beyond that, are not able to, to visit them. Um, you know, children who will not be able to visit relatives, say, in nursing homes or whatever, because they may well be in lockdown. There's, there's a whole range. I mean, there is uh, a tsunami of, of, of major problems that society is, is going to be facing as a result of this. And some of them will be the very tangible things. Some of them will be a lot more intangible. And I think, um, you know, the storm is yet to come, I think. It's just okay. Can I, just just, I'll let you come back and just intervene as well, though, Robbie. Let, let's not sell short the innovative ability of our teaching and non-teaching staff to respond to that challenge. Mm -hmm. I'm sure we're all already no, witnessing I, I, multiple online learning, learning for and, think, uh, and I, suggestions that are coming yeah, think, forward think, with regards to child education and good physical and mental health activity during this time. So there, 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 there is scope for mm -hmm. constructive response to those You're right. And I think, I think probably to, to yeah. some extent, yeah, while we've got to be realistic and put in place sort of where um, where there are things that are not, not possible to mitigate some of the problems that are going to be there and be honest about those. You know, I, I think you're right in terms of, I think it's also got to take a positive as well that, that you know, a crisis of this nature brings out sometimes the worst in some people, but also <coughs> brings out the, uh, 
the best in people and also can create a situation where some of the most innovative thinking arises out of that as well. And I think we've got to try and capture all of that. Robbie, you want to come back? Thank in? you, Chair. I've got one question. I'm just going to finish that point out um, because I, do, I think this is really important and we've, we've discussed it now. We were discussing it in 2016 when we had an assembly, then with three years of political failure, which is, hasn't helped us be ready, battle ready, shall we say. Um, socially deprived areas. Um, with regard to, we talked about it in the food poverty, but and that the eyes is on that, but also that's where, where mental health is is even worse. And and I'm not going to. Uh, I agree with the chair up to the point of the fact that actually uh, uh, social media is brilliant and using technology is great, but some in the socially deprived areas, perhaps those are the people who are going to have less. Uh, Availability of iPads, telephones, and, and broadband and stuff. So we have to factor this in, and I think it's an executive response, by the way. And, and the point I just want to make is there have been commitments made by the executive with regard to their mental health group. I would like to, I would like to hope that that group is considering that at the moment, and that you'll be playing your part, Minister. And the final question then is with regard to teachers. Um, Fourteen weeks from now, roughly, takes us up to the summer holidays. And then we have um, two, two months summer holidays. I just would like the Minister to give uh, confidence and comfort to teachers that with regard to any time lost, um, with regard to uh, any extended periods, that it doesn't affect their, in terms of their pay, their contributions, their yeah. pensions, and well, things I mean, like all, that. All, those, all those aspects, and I, I suppose, again, that level of confidence of anybody within the system who is, you know, in terms of teachers, in terms of other members of staff, that the pay continues in relation to that. Now, obviously, the flip side of that will be in terms of teaching that the teaching will carry on yeah. on that basis, albeit in a different, a different form. Um, on that basis, on it, but uh, no, there will be no, no disruption in terms of continuity of service. There will be no disruption in terms of um, the financial aspects of things. You know, so I, I give that assurance. As well. And again, beyond simply teaching. How, how does that apply to non? permanent teaching and non-teaching staff, such as substitute teachers, for example? Well, if substitution, I think, whenever they're, um, you know, if they're carrying on with the teaching side of it, they'll, they'll continue yeah. to be paid on that, on that basis. I mean, I think it may well, and again, depending on circumstances, um, for those who are, for instance, on substitute lists, in some cases it will restrict opportunities, in other cases it will actually yeah. expand them. The overriding objective in all of this, Chair, will be fairness to all staff. Mm -hmm. um, and that staff are not unfairly penalised because of circumstances beyond mm -hmm. their control. And we look at all yeah. of those. Okay. Robbie touched on contingency planning. Minister, you mentioned a COVID-19 group that had, you had established for contingency planning. Can I ask uh, who sits on that group? Well, there's, there's two groups we've been, we've been looking at. The, myself and the senior staff have met as a group also involving particularly directly the CCA. But additionally, uh, the Permanent Secretary, we have established a group which involves representatives of each of the sectors, um, education sectors, plus also the Education Authority, CCA, so that those people around those are meeting regularly as well. Yeah, Chair, um, a group involving all of the, st the main statutory partners and indeed our non-statutory partners in the sectoral bodies. Um, to share ideas, to identify issues, and I have to say, well, the first meeting of the group was on Friday. It was really useful to hear um, uh, colleagues from the different sectors suggest things that we need to look at and suggest ideas for dealing with those. So that will meet regularly, and that's in addition to the internal um, business contingency arrangements in the department. Um, can I just say? Colleagues, again, sitting behind, I know our trade union colleagues uh, would like to have a seat at that table, and I have no mm. difficulty with that mm. whatsoever because we need uh, input from colleagues who are at the cold face too. And uh, I want to talk to um, our trade union colleagues about ideas, suggestions, and how they can continue to help us with their input. I'm sure they would welcome that and perhaps ask why they weren't there sooner. Um, we convened. We convened the first meeting at really, really short notice, and it was a be there or be square. It was convened within okay. less than a few hours, chair, and it wasn't possible to get everybody who should have been there round the table. So it's just I, the speed okay. at which we're moving. Can I ask history. if there is representation of special schools at that group? Um, well, we don't have a sectoral body for special schools, but given that all special schools are uh, come under the control of the Education Authority, the Education Authority is there, and there are lots of representation there. 
Um, we don't have separate representation from primary schools or post-primary schools or special schools, but we have all the managing authorities round the table, including non-statutory bodies like the Governing Bodies Association. Can I make a suggestion, given that you did ask for suggestions earlier? There is a, a special schools strategic leadership group. Um, get, if you need me to make a stronger case for their inclusion in this, you, you will be aware of the lack of confidence in the Education Authority with regards to the representation of special educational needs, and I would strongly encourage you to include the Special School Strategic <coughs> Leadership Group in that planning group, um, and also not least because of the significant amount of special schools pupils that most likely find themselves as it stands today, in an at-risk category for social isolation. Is that thank, possible? Thank, thank, I can see no reason why it is okay. possible. Thank you for that suggestion. And not, one other suggestion would be, um, we have established and Department of Education official Cathy Galway has engaged um, intensively with it, an all-party working group on, on early education and child care, it has extensive representation across child care provision I would suggest engagement early, urgent engagement with representatives from that collection of bodies as, as a matter of urgency and be happy to assist with that if indeed that is useful given the centrality I think, I think of childcare provision. That's, that's to already this. happened. It's happened, that's super, that's great. Okay. Um, can I bring in Justin McNulty then? Thank you, Chair, and thank you, Minister and Premier Secretary, for coming before committee. I know you are under huge pressure and um, so thank you for taking the time for coming today. I also want to applaud, applaud the um, principals, teachers and teachers' unions for taking a measured approach to this crisis and trying to act as one, which I think is, is uh, very important in the midst of this crisis. The UK government <coughs> have adopted a different approach to the rest of the world, and contrary to the World Health Organization rec recommendations, experts who have experience in Wuhan and China and in Italy are saying adherence to this herd immunity approach is reckless and is going to cause lives. The whole world is social distancing and you're telling us it's okay to pack hundreds of thousands of school children's classes into 30 by 30 classrooms, recognising that children are vectors. We know that children will probably survive and will be able to cope with this virus if, if, if they get it, um, but it's about more than them, it's about the vulnerable people they come into contact with on a daily basis, be their parents or grandparents. Expert medical and scientific advice, and how 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 can we've how can that be so different between cross and castle blending? I've, I've asked that to minister before, and please don't tell me that's the same as between Lauren and Stranraer. It's clear that the UK government is making decisions in accordance with school terms in Britain, which are different to the school terms here. Can you give some clarity around that matter? No, I principal. School, school, school terms are largely speaking. I mean, there may be a slight variation on the odd day here and there, but they're broadly speaking the same. Yeah, I mean, the, the one issue, just suppose, is that in particular in England, the, the school term moves a little bit into into July. Um, uh, but broadly speaking, you know, the same general format of uh, like a call it sort of autumn winter term, spring term up to Easter, and then a the time between Easter and, and my understanding is the times are, are quite significantly different in no, terms of start dates and finish dates for school terms. Not, not to any great significant level. I would, I would have thought in relation, and I don't, I don't think uh, that that you know whether I don't know for the sake of argument that, that in 2020 um, you know school started on the, the 5th of January here and started on the 6th of January somewhere else. I mean the, the reality is actually there's a little bit of variation even in terms of school dates, and, uh, a little bit of flexibility. Sometimes the frustration of parents. Um, even between schools here in that regard, so there isn't a significant um, any level of significant difference. I, I'm not quite sure how that. I mean, the only issue that potentially would play into, as we move ahead, would be what some of the scenario planning around A levels, um, because depending upon what approach is taken to public examinations. But out, outside of that, I don't think any of the term dates has any particular bearing on um, any thinking in, in, in relation okay, well, to that. Okay, well, they stand to be corrected on that. Uh, Minister, but my understanding is that the school terms are significantly different in uh, the north and across the water. Um, well, I mean, no, no, presumably term, terms will be uh, yeah, different between Northern Ireland and the rest of the world. There will be a wide range of, 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 of different dates. But again, I'm, I'm not sure there's a particular, the term dates are particularly in any way significant in okay. terms of the tagging of this. Okay. Um, 
principals, teachers, parents, they are already voting with their feet. The tea shock last night spoke about the calm before the storm. The storm is coming. In the throes of this crisis, when we've already lost discipline, when we're already not conforming with, with direction being given from our leaders, our ministers, our, our, our first minister, deputy first minister, if that's happening already, when the storm arrives and we have lost that discipline, we've lost that conformity of behaviour and calm, that discipline cannot be reinstated. So I think that's a consideration that needs to be thought about. Um, we need social obedience as opposed to social disobedience, which can be impacted by these decisions around school closures. Five teaching unions are imploring you to close. They recognise that this is a, a public health emergency and they would hope that you would hear them on that. Parents should not be left thinking that they have to make a judgement call knowing that they have a vulnerable child at home or have a vulnerable adult or um, grandparents around home. It needs to be called this week. Teachers need time alone in their classrooms to prepare lesson plans, book work for offline and online lessons away from school for their pupils. Schools have been empty now for a number of days, which means that schools are most likely safe places and teachers who may have vulnerable conditions, may have vulnerabilities, feel safe going to that school if they remain closed. That's a very important consideration. As of next Monday, staff will not be turning up. Pregnant mothers, we've heard mentioned already, vulnerable teachers, maybe vulnerable uh, staff members, they will not be turned up. What sort of chaos will ensue because of that? Have you any faith in the UK government's PHA modelling, given it appears to be out of sync with the rest of the world? And who are you putting at risk by following <coughs> the advice forthcoming from that modelling? I understand. The, the childcare issues, the special needs children issues, the school meals, exams, are all massive considerations. And there will be no perfect solutions. I know, Permanent Secretary, you've said that there is no good outcome. Um, but there is a good outcome to school, schools closing. There's a good outcome to schools closing if it saves lives. We've got to factor in. We've got to put in place a plan that factors in bringing out the best in people, and we can only achieve that by calmness, <coughs> by adopting a, a universal approach across this island. I believe in firmly. The GA have already exhibited that by um, opening up Crow Park or HQ to drive through test for drive through test facility. But we need, I think, we need calmness and a uniformity of approach across this island. And that's what people are crying out from from my perspective. Okay, I think that's. If that was an exam question, it would probably be discuss in that there's regard. A few, there's um, a few questions. There are, there are a few Go questions ahead, in there. I mean, I suppose maybe to pick up. I, look, I agree with you in terms of calmness. I think that has not always been particularly displayed. Unfortunately, not all elected representatives have acted yeah, always yeah. entirely responsibly as, as well in relation to that. Um, you're right in terms of preparation time, and I think in terms of when we move to the point where schools will close, will, and a number of schools have used some of this already, there will need to be specific preparation time for teachers and uh, to be able to operate within schools to prepare up some of those. I think, I think that's without, um, without prejudice. Look, I, I've made the point, first of all, I don't have any particular doctrine or view over uh, where we follow. You say, there's, you say there are good outcomes. I think any outcome which is pursued is not wholly watertight. Any op uh, option that is pursued will have negatives as well as positives. It's a question of where you see the balance uh, within that. And to say, for example, simply if you close schools, there, that, that is simply a positive outcome, which is no, um, which is entirely risk-free. No, there are there are downsides to doing that. It's a question of working out where the balance lies within those. Um, you mentioned uh, the issue of herd immunity. Now, to be fair, I think even to the UK government, I don't think that's been anything that has ever been used by that. It's not something which in any way motivates or indeed is a view that would be shared uh, by the executive or myself in that regard. The specific decisions that have been taken have been taken on the basis of the advice of the, of the chief medical officer. The chief medical officer will be in close liaison with um, uh, his counterparts, both within the UK and within the Republic of Ireland. And I've also said that if the chief medical officer had made a recommendation which puts us in a different place to where, uh, what is happening in London or Cardiff or Edinburgh, or Dublin, you know, 
I don't really care in one sense whether we are, for any political reason, in step with anybody or not in step with anybody. I would take the very professional advice that is there from our own experts and to try to make that, that compatible. It, it is, as I said, about trying to take the best decisions which actually ultimately um, save lives. Um, as I said, we're in a fluid situation, so advice uh, you know, in terms of what the, the best balance of those things, I'm sure, will be changing. And I will move um, with that. I think it is important also that as much certainty is given to people and as much preparation time is also given as well. That's got to be based upon the conditions that, that are there. But that's what we're seeking to do across the board as we, we move ahead. I can't remember whether that was all the questions you, you asked. But conscious, we're okay. almost out of time. But Justin, if you want a brief supplementary, happy to bring you back in there. And then we've got William and I should say sorry as well. I mean, look, the other thing as well, different governments have taken di slightly different approaches throughout the world. They've done different measures at different times. There are different things that, on either side of borders. So I think it is. It would be erroneous um, to make a view of saying UK doing one thing, rest of the world doing another. And I think that's um, again probably taking this into a slightly pejorative uh, position in, in, in relation to that. There are different ones, and look, uh, we can only go on the best belief of advice that it, that is got. Um, when all this is over, I think people will look back and say it. it's not simply a question as well. One of the things we also got to be very careful of is not something which takes a, a short term. Um, even sort of reduction, which and think that that will be the end thing. I mean, there are dangers with this virus that we see second and third waves within that, and all those factors have got to be taken into account in terms of, of what actions are taken and when, when they're taken to try to, to save as many lives as possible. Okay. Thank you. Okay, William Humphrey. Thanks, Chairman. Thank you both very much for your time today, because I'm, I'm aware that you're both hugely busy and you're working in the most difficult. Of circumstances, and I want to thank you both for the leadership that you're giving. Um, I'm reassured somewhat to hear that decisions that are being taken are being taken on medical and scientific advice from professional experts. Uh, I think that's important. We have more experts around this issue, issue than we had around Brexit. Uh, if we go by social media, uh, uh, media indeed, uh, decisions should not be taken by political dogma uh, or by politicians trying to grab headlines. But the one thing I would say is that the clarity of message is absolutely important and the consistency of that message. So mixed messages are highly dangerous and grossly irresponsible. And I have absolutely no time for anyone, politicians or anyone else, who cannot stick to a message and because that is so irresponsible in the circumstances in which we find ourselves today. Derek, can I just ask, in terms of what you talked about earlier, in terms of the community sector. Mm -hmm. I had some phone calls yesterday from people who are working in the community sector in terms of jobs and projects and so on, about the fear of their continuation uh, and roles and whatever, and the, and the threats that there are to the community sector. In fact, I'm going to a meeting this afternoon around some of those issues. Can I ask you to expand on how those people might be deployed? Or if you can't do it today, if you could maybe make us aware of how those people yeah. might be deployed in the sort of work you were talking about to, to alleviate problems, yeah. pressures? Yeah. Um, I probably can't go into detail because I haven't seen the detail, okay. so it's conceptual at this stage. But you're absolutely right. There, there, there are um, particular areas of Northern Ireland, well, probably right across Northern Ireland, the community and voluntary sectors are very strong. We have a strong voluntary and community sector. There are people working in specific communities who have resources, who can reach out to vulnerable people and reach out to vulnerable families. And you know that best in your own constituency. And we do work with some of those organisations in the wider educational field. So, for example, um, could we envisage a situation where meals are prepared? Um, at a central location, but we could use voluntary and community groups that reach out to individual families to distribute those rather than bringing large numbers of young people to one location. And we're looking at those options. So that is one model. Now, we have just heard overnight uh, about additional funding which will be available to the executive. So, you know, I don't want to put a bid in just yet, but as we speak, all departments are looking at how they could use additional funding, if they had it, 
to fund various mechanisms. As the Minister has said, the school meals issue is an interesting one. Most of the funding goes on the staff who prepare and distribute those school meals. Now, we do not want to disadvantage those, so it isn't just a case of taking all the money spent on the school meal service and giving it to another group. Um, we could only take a portion, a small portion of that money, if we want to preserve the uh, security of those staff. So if there's additional money available, who knows, we might be able to give it to organisations to mobilise to deliver school meals at a local community level. That's only one option. I heard a school principal on last night about, um, and you know, I'm sure colleagues behind saw that, where schools could actually continue to provide school meals, but um, bring very small numbers of pupils in to access school meals based on a social isolation approach. I don't know whether that's practical, but we need to look at all of those. Yeah. I just am aware you know, in my own constituency, sports clubs, football teams yeah. and so on who are, who are doing work yeah. and uh, flute bands and so on <coughs> as well. Can I just ask that in terms of, Minister, you've said in terms of uh, schools, as the First Minister has said in terms of schools, that it's not if they'll close, it's when they'll close. Um, and listening to what you said earlier, in terms of I think the key thing here, I was speaking to principal and declaring interest as a governor in two schools, I was speaking to the principal uh, of a uh, secondary school in North Belfast the other night, he rang me. I think preparation is key to that, time is key to that. Um, we, we need to, these people need to prepare for um, uh, the, you know, the, the home um, education or, or whatever might unfold and circumstances will be different across Northern Ireland. So in terms of the teachers and the staff, in terms of the parents, in terms of child care and child minding and all of that, time is of the essence in terms of that preparation. Mm. It can't be something which is announced one day no. and, if, and it comes in no, the next I, day. So I, could you expand on no, that? I think, look, I think there's two, two aspects to that in terms of the way that things would be, would be phased when we reach that point, whenever they, the evidence are. There's got to be, a, as you said, it can't simply be a situation where um, you announce one day the school closes the next. You need some level of lead-in time, particularly for parents, initially in that regard, to be able to, uh, you know, make their own arrangements. Now, I've, I've indicated on a number of occasions that, that parents do need to be thinking ahead, but uh, even with that, I think people, uh, parents do need to actually put in particular uh, care arrangements. You know, I know. Probably speaking personally as somebody who's, uh, who's a carer of, of knowing that you, it's not something you can actually then just adjust at the drop of a hat in that regard. So there's going to be a little preparation that time. I suppose the second phase within that, and I think you can sequence these things, is to reach a point at which there is the the uh, the end of, if you like, of pupils going into the school as part of that uh, closure, but but also then allowing additional time beyond that uh, for the. Uh, the staff, the teachers, to be basically adding to their preparation in terms of lesson plans, in terms of, you know, and whether that's through uh, staff development or school development or the, um, uh, you know, exceptional closure side of things. On it again, there'll be a bit of sense of flexibility. So it's it's kind of two buffers before you reach the point where, in if you could sort of say officially the, the school is closed, um, and also as was arising out of that, there would also then need to be a look at uh, what we do in terms of the broader teaching and care arrangements for um, those children, particularly mentioned in terms of the emergency services. So that would be something that would then happen subsequently uh, to that. I think it's, it's best that we disaggregate the, the process a little bit in that, in that regard. So, yeah, I think there's, there's, there's roots around, around yeah. that. And, and just one point, and it's actually picking up a point that Mr McNulty made. Um, even if schools were to close, it's not the case that we put a big chain round the school yeah. gate and they don't exist anymore. We still have teachers who are being paid, and schools are not inherently unsafe places. Mm -hmm. So whatever about the preparation time, which is really important, and I accept mm -hmm. your point entirely, um, there is a continuum here whereby you know teachers can maybe engage in how best to facilitate uh, distance learning, and I'd be really keen to engage you know, with our trade union colleagues about what is possible in that space, what can be done on an ongoing basis over the week. So it's not everything has to be done by day one, and it's an ongoing thing. Could you just, Chair, as well, um, pay tribute to governors, principals, Absolutely. teachers and staff across the education sector for the tremendous leadership, dedication and commitment they're showing uh, to the young people in their care at this time. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Rob Newton. Uh, thank you, Chair. And, uh, 
Again, echo uh, words of William. I really appreciate Peter taking his time. And, and Mr. Baker, I can only imagine the pressure that you're under uh, at the moment. So uh, thank you for coming along today. I, I, I do think, you know, it has been said already, but I, if we are to succeed in this position, I was nearly going to say win, but I don't think there are any winners out of this situation. But we do need a united approach right across all sectors of education and all political sectors if we are going to 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 succeed in this. I, I would, just a couple of minor questions, uh, I would make a plea if we can, because I know some schools in my own constituency who have been doing <coughs> excellent work in around pupils who are finding it difficult with the school life. Uh, and if we can maybe in this very difficult situation, um, pay some attention to how we might support those children who are getting support in school at the moment, but in this new evolving situation. Uh, so that, and I would use uh, your, your own uh, words, uh, Mr. Baker, that they don't fall through the cracks. Uh, I think that, that, that would be important. Could I just ask you uh, at this stage, what would you think as we move into this period and when schools do close, what will actually, can you give a sort of description of what activity would be like over that period until we're back to normal uh, education? I, 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 think, I think, Robin, the, the position particularly as regards would be to try to ensure um, that the teaching and learning continues on, which is why in terms of some of the packs that will be available, in terms of some of the online resource, I suppose one of the other things I, think, uh, I know Robbie earlier on mentioned about the um, uh, the issue of particularly say within deprived communities not having maybe the access to uh, uh, sometimes those things is also the case most particularly with some of the internet resources and I know um, from my 45 minute stint as, as economy minister the other week uh, there's obviously major concern that particularly in some uh, rural areas in the west of the province in terms of broadband issues so uh, the provision that will Schools will be looking at this, I think, in terms of a cocktail of, of provision uh, in terms of the logistics of that. But the aim would be to effectively carry on as, as best as possible the, um, uh, the online teaching and indeed the, uh, the curriculum. Obviously, I suppose one of the areas which will fairly inevitably be highly, if not entirely restricted, will also be certain practical classes which would involve, um, you know, which simply can't be done at home simply, you know, will not be able to be fulfilled in that regard. So, you know, it, it has to be something which is fairly adaptable in that, in that context, but we want to ensure that children don't miss out, even if it's for a few months, in terms of their, their education as much as possible. Okay. And when it comes to the awarding body making their decisions on examination results and mm -hmm. so on, I imagine I'm going to say this, tell me if I'm wrong, we may not meet the criteria as well for an, an A, a B or a C or a D. Well, I, I, think, I, think, I think to be fair, CCA have done quite a bit of, a bit of work in this. Look, I think if you have a situation and there are a range of options which are being pursued, and some of this will be determined by the, the timing, if you have an option where, for example, physical exams were not able to be taking place and uh, there are other ways of, of doing that. You know, can you have methodology which is absolutely as robust as simply doing an exam? No, I think probably there's an argument you couldn't, but I think there is a reasonable level of confidence because this is, on a much smaller scale, something which happens to pupils already. There can be a range of reasons why people can't sit a particular exam. So it, it's not as if we're entirely on uncharted waters there. Um, as I said, one of, as both Derek and myself have indicated, I think one of the particular issues as regards that will be how we are compatible with the wider um, UK sort of qualifying system in terms of awarding bodies. I think it's clear that whatever methodology is eventually reached, I think the universities are in a good place to say that they will accommodate and recognise it will not be a question of CCA or any other body saying, well, here's what we're doing, and this is then not going to be recognised by a particular university, I think. Yeah, but it will be part of a wider, wider picture. We're going to obviously get yeah. consistency across that. And I would just add one point to that, Mr Newton. Um, in its contingency planning for what may happen 
The overriding objective of SIA is fairness to pupils, and that is shared right across the United Kingdom. And I suspect the decisions, whilst what happens locally will be taken by the Minister for Education, it will be a joint decision right across the uh, four countries, four UK countries and the respective education ministers. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. I think the committee will receive evidence from SIA in the near future as well, and I, I am confident that we can create a way forward for completion of examinations. I think there are are may, potentially I think, more I, urgent I, considerations. May, I think well, there's, there's major challenges with examinations and indeed a lot of other things. The broad educational issues, I think, are ultimately solvable. They not, may not be done in as perfect a way as they're able to be done, but I think they're solvable. I think the bigger issues, as well, a number of members have said, is actually where we see the impact in terms of the health side. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, can I check? Karen Mullen, Deputy Chair, would you like to come back in briefly, and, and Justin McNulty as well, if we can keep our, our closing that, remarks brief. Yeah, just on that final point, um, I have been told oh. on, on Monday there was a third of children who went to Tainton School, and we're hearing that, that we expect that the rise in terms of parents voting with their feet. Uh, these are children who are at home at the minute without the educational provision. Mm-hmm. And I will now speak as a mother, not as a politician, trying to grab a headline. I have a 15-year-old daughter, and the more and more I hear, she will be staying at home because her health comes first. Um, what educational provision will be put in place for those children? Well, look, I think we want to work on an overall package in relation to that, and I think schools should be providing, even now, in terms of what is there, you know, uh, for pupils who will be at, at home. Indeed, while the scale is of a, a much greater level, it's not a unique situation on that basis. So. But I think we want to work to a situation where we get an overall package for everybody in, in that regard. Okay. But it will be on a school by school basis because yeah. school leaders and the individual teachers are best placed to know what is appropriate for their classes mm-hmm. and what facilities are available. Um, but schools have already been doing excellent planning in that regard yeah. within the constraints yeah, within which they are operating, yeah. of course. Thank you. Okay, Justin, briefly. Yeah. Thank you, Chair. Just very quickly, why is the civil contingency group? Only meeting now. Did you not see this coming? Well, I think. Look, I think there's been ongoing work between uh, departments. This is not the first meeting today. There's been other meetings. Certainly, was meeting last week. Uh, the point I was making in terms of this meeting at present, all departments are represented. Um, had the education committee not been sitting, Derek and myself would have been at that. But we have senior officials uh, from the department uh, at that. It met last week too, by the way. Mm-hmm. Just last week, okay. first time. When was the first time they met? I think it met on Thursday mm-hmm. as a civil contingencies group for the first time. Okay. But that's not that's not to say that while it may not met in that format, that there's been ongoing discussions between different departments oh, yeah. and, and arm's length bodies. And I think look we've all found with this that, that uh, part of the problem with this is the speed of change in terms of the uh, the coronavirus has been a challenge probably to everybody in, in public life, not just here, but in, in different parts of the, the world. OK, a couple of closing questions, Minister. First, um, are you assured that there are adequate materials, for example, hand wash in all schools across Northern yeah. Ireland, having asked them to remain open? We even... Sorry. Yeah, we, yeah, we, we have we've raised this in the, yeah. maybe let Derek, the, yeah, the, the education authority. We raised this as recently, well, earlier this week, and indeed yesterday. The education authority will ensure that all schools who need access to such materials will get them. Can I ask you to double check that? I will. I am receiving accounts of schools very close to home that may need assistance in relation to future supplies of um, materials to ensure hygiene in all schools, and I I would be grateful for your follow-up. No, we'll we'll do a follow-up. And I I would say as well, I mean, if there... We'll we'll follow up on both the general issue, but also if there are issues around specific schools, particularly on that that issue, again, if you get them to... We will proceed up directly with the EA as well. just very, very briefly. Just breaking from Westminster, only MPs listed in the order paper will be allowed into the Commons Chamber. So we're saying only MPs on the order paper will be allowed into the Commons Chamber, but we're saying school children go back to school. Well, generally speaking, Justin, MPs don't require a parent uh, who's in the frontline medical service to be able to look after them. So I mean, yeah. there are a degree of differences sure. in, in, okay. in connection with that. I'm going to try and help you get the clues here, Minister. Um, you, to, to just seek as much clarity as we can in closing. You've said that schools will close. You yep. can't say when. You say that 
it is on conditions. Can you say what those conditions no, I th- are? Look, I, I think you know, there will be work to try and get a, a broader situation where there can be uh, clear agreement um, on that. I think, as I said, it's a fluid situation. The conditions are that that, um, that, that is um, supported by clear medical advice in that regard. I think you know, I'm not going to jump into a position which is, is outside that, that medical advice. So anything will be done will be compatible with Okay. Um, that, that okay. Well, in process. terms of terms of closing remarks from myself, then um, personal responsibility, a united approach, and yeah. clear messaging has been cited as absolutely vital to help us protect as many people as we can from the worst effects of this virus. Um, it it's irrefutable that there are hundreds of schools across Northern Ireland today unable to or deciding not to accept your messaging on this matter. Uh, that's just observable fact. I, I don't doubt your sincerity and integrity or commitment to protect staff and pupils, but as of today, you're asking school leaders and parents to respond to an increasingly unacceptable and untenable situation in our schools. There is significant confusion and concern, and I do think you need to establish urgently a date for school closure and to set out a much clearer plan for the wide range of contingency provision that is going to be necessary. Chair, look, I, I entirely take on board what, what you've said. As I said, um, actions will, that will be compatible with um, the broader uh, medical advice that is, that is there will be followed. I think, as with all these things, any, of, any actions that any of us take will be in their nature imperfect on that basis, but if, if any of us, in whatever shape or form, can make our contribution to trying to reduce the impact of this, you know, even you know, even it means like in, in any case that, that any action that any of us take that helps save a single life, I think is something that will be worthwhile. So, okay. you know, from that point of view, uh, I can only go on the best advice that, that I can get in relation to it. I think it's important that as we chart a way ahead, I completely agree that as we chart a way ahead, the more certainty that's there and the more that we can actually phase timing in relation to this to um, indicate, as I said, uh, where there can be then dates for the, the closures. It will be on the, the basis of uh, a point at which schools will not be um, taking in pupils and then uh, a period where there can be some additional level of preparation for, for staff in that regard. Okay. And as I said, with, I think as part of any picture, will have to be also the impact that we have on the frontline medical staff, and there will be a bit of work done to try to ensure uh, that, um, I should say, frontline emergency staff, uh, there will be work done to ensure that there's provisions, along with all the other issues that have been raised, are, are done as best they possibly can. Yeah, mention was made earlier to uh, a COVID-19 emergency bill. If you need this uh, committee to reconvene at urgent notice, we give you our full commitment to reconvene um, as, I, as quickly I appreciate as we that. Can. I mean, I think the, the issue will just be in terms of enactment, um, and obviously there will be discussions between the executive and the, the assembly. You know, whether that's by way of ex- some form of uh, legislative consent motion, you know, because I think the issue is, I think the, the bill itself covers, while obviously our focus is on the education side of it, it covers actually things which will involve each of the departments, and some will be quite departmental specific, and some will be more generic in their in their nature. So I, I suspect it's probably more likely to be taken. And I very much appreciate the offer um, that if there's anything needed, and if there's any additional briefing that we need to give, yep. not I'm sure we can officials can do that. Conscious, we've rescheduled the response to the systemic failure in EA with regards to special educational needs provision. We'll return to that as soon as okay. as possible. Okay. And I, I would ask you as Minister to give particular consideration to the additionally high concern and confusion that is apparent within special schools at this moment. No, I, look, I'm, I'm acutely aware of that. I'm working with PHA directly on that. I think if there's, if there's something could be announced in a wider context, that's the preferable route. If that's not able to be possible, then something very specific, I think, would be uh, announced in relation to um, vulnerable children. Okay. Minister, Permanent Secretary, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> I'll ask the clerk if there's a need to summarise any actions or content to move to our next agenda item.
so chairperson um, members will keep me right here in terms of going forward perhaps the committee wants to write to the department uh, the permanent secretary helpfully set out the five areas uh, that are being covered under their emergency plans so perhaps we can actually see they'll have a structure um, for uh, emergency um, they will have a structure, so perhaps we could actually just see that. And uh, they may also have what's called a sit rep, a situation report, which may be produced daily or weekly. So perhaps the committee could actually ask to see the weekly sit rep, um, so you can keep up to speed with all the things that are happening in those five areas. Additionally, then, um, if we do that, um, is the committee also um, wanting to, uh, when the department knows, uh, ask it to provide a breakdown of the additional funding, um, where that's going to go, and uh, perhaps to follow up in writing just on the question of the supply of cleaning materials um, to schools, as, as was mentioned uh, by the chairperson. And perhaps also then, if I've understood correctly, the committee is uh, inviting SIA and the Education Authority to come up and brief on their contingency plans. Great. Anything else? Clerk, can we perhaps follow up the, the question with regards to an assessment of up-to-date detail of, as insofar as is known, of how many schools are closed and how many schools are open? Those schools which are having training days? Yeah. Mm. Can, can yep, I, Deputy uh, Chair. Um, uh, it, what advice should be given to schools if they have a confirmed or suspected case? And um, what advice, what directive has been given to staff who fall under those categories that have already been told to socially isolate? And what advice has been given to parents who have vulnerable children yeah. or vulnerable people in the home? Okay. Okay. Thank you. And how how staff A is affected um, for schools that are closed now and that took the decision themselves? By so staff for A. how teachers pay. Um, sub teachers and temporary staff, how their their does their pay continue even though they have taken the decision themselves to close the school? And in the member also means classroom assistants. Yeah, yeah. yeah. All staff. All staff. That's we. To be fair, the, the, the department secretary did cover that, but it would be good to get it in writing just yeah, for the yeah. confirmation. I think we've potentially facilitated an impromptu engagement here, so I'll. Um, progress accordingly, uh, Clark. A another issue that had been raised with me was some reassurance for parental rights to withdraw pupils on the grounds of authorised absence. If we could check with the department that that right to withdraw on the grounds of authorised absence, if it is in line with UK government advice regards social isolation, that it, it won't count against attendance records. Okay. Believe it or not, the, the dedication of some parents to their children's education is, a, is expressing concern that what they feel is no choice but to withdraw pupils from school could affect their attendance records. If we could seek clarity on that as well. I think it might be worth seeking a, a written response guaranteeing Adequate materials are available in all schools in Northern Ireland to maintain required levels of hygiene to necessary to combat coronavirus. Sure. Justin, yep. Just, just given what the um, five education boards have done, um, or sorry, the five teaching unions have done, can we write as a committee to the minister imploring him to close schools to school children now? I don't think you're going to have a majority position on that, or united position on that. Potentially, I think that I think people's views were articulately made to him on that matter today. The minister's been here for one hour forty-five minutes. Yep. Answering questions. Yep. I think he made it explicitly clear on a number of occasions that it's not if they're going to close it, it's when they're going to close. But he's going to act on advice from the from the chief medical officer, so we could be in a situation, perhaps in the next day or so, that that advice comes from the chief medical officer. It's a very fluid situation, um, and I think at the end of the day, any decision that he takes, and I think he, he made this point very clearly, <coughs> the minister is in a very 
particular personal circumstance. You heard him saying he's a care for his very elderly mother around these things. The minister isn't going to take any decisions going to willfully harm people's lives, and I don't think anybody would 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 suggest that he is. But at the same time, um, people have a different emphasis on this stuff, and I have nephews and nieces out of school as well. I don't want them any more exposed than any other child. But but I wouldn't be comfortable with a letter imploring him to close schools when, he, when he's already sat here for an hour and 45 minutes and said he's taking advice from professionals. Yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to move us on here. I, I, I think we, we gave a thorough um, expose of our positions and our concerns in relation to this, and we're about to hear um, from the Northern Ireland Teaching Council as well on this matter, so I, I would ask that we hold on that. Indeed, just just indeed. to make a point, I, I don't yeah. believe the minister should it should be an executive way approach because there's so many other that come on behind it. Um, our position is clear from last Friday: schools should close, but it shouldn't be on the education department on their own. Yeah, could I, Clark? Would it be appropriate to propose a very short comfort <laughs> break while we await our our next evidence session? Yes. Absolutely, chair. Yeah, members okay? content. Chair, members content. Well, I'll yeah, need to go in because I have to go twelve. Okay. okay. okay members go. content. Take a short break. Yep. Yeah. So your program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed.
This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. Okay, members, welcome us back into public session and our agenda item six on today's business, which is a, rep a presentation from Northern Irish Teacher Council representatives. You have Jerry Murphy from Into and Jerry Cameron from the NAHT. Thank you very much indeed for coming today at such late notice. Um, we felt it was an important opportunity to invite you to the committee to give us a clearer understanding and idea of the extent of the confusion and concern that does exist in our schools today. I'm very grateful for the opportunity to hear from you. You'll have an opportunity to make a presentation of no more than 10 to 15 minutes and then for members to ask questions. I Just a second, the clock. I yeah. think we have another witness. We may have another witness. Who is it? Would you like to introduce Do we? Ourselves? No. Yes. Come forward. Do, yeah, you want to join the table? Yep. Come on ahead. Okay. So I, I'll Is give our I'll give our witnesses an opportunity to introduce themselves, make a short presentation, and then we'll take questions. Okay. Okay. Thanks very much. Jerry Murphy, chair of the NITC, I'm Northern Secretary of the Irish National Teachers Organisation. Harry Greer, NHT. I'm Jerry Cameron. I'm the president of the NHT. I'm also school principal in Belfast. Okay, you're very welcome. Okay, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for your kind invitation to appear here this morning. Um, and indeed, I'm going to take this opportunity to thank the committee for their starting work over recent weeks. Um, it's much appreciated uh, in the education community as a whole. Um, so, in respect to the issue in front of us, the coronavirus, the OVD 19, um, our concerns are firstly for the health and well-being of the children and young people in our care. But we are a trade, we do rep represent trade unions, and our concerns go beyond the children and young people, of course, to our members uh, and their health and well-being, and of course, broader society. Um, it would be fair to say, and the Chair alluded to it as have a number of members of the committee over the course of the previous uh, interaction, um, that there is a huge degree of unease, concern and, uh, and upset um, across the educational community as a whole. Um, 18,000 teachers, you know, 340,000 children and young people in our schools. The parents uh, of those children, the carers of those children, this entire section of our society uh, is, you know, confused, angry, uh, angry maybe too, well, angry, no, people are angry, uh, but what is lacking here is is clarity, clarity around a number of things. The minister is continually referring to the chief medical officer and to the science, but I have to say that there is no clarity around the science out there. I think it would be uh, helpful if the minister would, would uh, if you would share the modelling 
um, associated with that science. If you would share the modelling around the spread of the virus and the impact of the virus, you made some reference to it earlier. I think that would be helpful uh, for everyone concerned to get a better appreciation and understanding of what he, what he is actually relying upon. The second thing, the second major concern is around the fact that the schools remain open at all. Uh, the the community, the educational community, is voting with its feet, mm -hmm. as one of your numbers already said, on which several of you have alluded to. Um, there are, as the chair said, hundreds of schools closed today. There are 1,130. Uh, uh, Roughly 1,130 schools in total. Um, so you know we're looking at possibly as many as 40% of those schools being closed now. I don't have the numbers any more than the permanent secretary has the numbers, but I can tell you that the Northern Ireland Teachers Council is today seeking to survey those 1,130 schools to ascertain what uh, what attendances are like. Because anecdotally, we're hearing those are way down attendances in terms of children and in attendances in terms of staff. Uh, so we're attempting to survey as we speak uh, those, sco those schools uh, to see if we can put some numbers on that, because I think that would be helpful for everybody. Um, and I can't stress enough that we're approaching this from, the, from a place where we wish to be helpful. We wish to make a contribution, a further contribution, I should say, rather. Um, we wish to assist the Minister and the Department, and we will continue, as we have been doing and as our members have been doing, to assist in their schools and the communities that they work with. Um, the, as I said, teachers are playing their part, and, and Mr Humphreys is gone, but he made a very telling point around consistency of message. That, you know, there is a complete inconsistency here. You know, effectively, there are three pieces of advice out there, or three sources of advice out there. It's a sort of a smosmoborg of, a, you know, a scientific and you know, a procedural advice available to you. You have what happened, the advice coming from the Republic of Ireland. You have the re advice coming from our own uh, Chief Medical Officer and the PHA, which the Department and the Minister are relying upon. Then you have Boris Johnson issuing advice and direction on Friday, all of which you know our members are being expected to interpret and apply. Um, I, I think it's grossly unfair you know, that, in addition to everything else that has been foisted upon them, they've been called upon to do that. The, the Permanent Secretary did a very good job in, the earlier, in his earlier contribution in outlining the extent and the difficulty of the problem. But um, as Ms Mullen pointed out, or you know, attempted to clarify with the Minister, there is a, there, there's a, an increasing feeling amongst certainly my members that you know, they have been looked at here, uh, you know, that this thing has been approached as a workforce problem and not the health problem, the health pandemic global pandemic that it is. Um, and, and really, you know, I think the Minister needs and the Department needs to sit down and we would be hopeful that they will sit down with us and, you know, let's talk that piece through and see what it is, because my members and our members wouldn't be averse, I don't believe, to contributing to society, further contributing to uh, measures to, to protect and enhance the well-being of society and the children and young people and themselves. One other point, and then I'm going to hand over to my colleagues here. What needs to be remembered by all of the decision makers in this uh, unfolding crisis is that teachers are citizens. They are parents. They have responsibilities of a caring nature of their own. And while we are happy to engage and talk about distant learning and providing that learning and everything that goes with that, um, we would ask that everyone keep sight of the fact, as I said, that they are citizens, parents and carers in their own right, and that they will have responsibilities which will have to be met as well. Okay, thanks, Jerry. Can I extend my thanks to Chris and the committee for inviting us here today at such short notice? I know that it, it is unusual, but I guess we're in unusual territory. 
Um, I would echo um, what Jerry has said about um, clarity and consistency of message is really desirable at the moment, but unfortunately, and this is a really key point, that's no longer possible due to the wide range of variable scenarios that are emerging in schools. Uh, and the, the simple reason why there's a wide range of scenarios arising is because you've got 340,000 children and a workforce of 18,000 teachers and quite a lot more um, <coughs> ancillary staff and support, teach, support workers. And that's, that's a sizable um, proportion of the population in Northern Ireland. And they're getting a message from the media and from the, the, the wide range of sources and reliable sources are what we're hoping that they're fo focusing on, um, which is telling them, for example, to socially isolate for 14 days if a member of their family is unwell. It's the same advice for a teacher as it is for any other member of, of, of society. So those variable scenarios are arising in schools and they're, they are making the opening of schools no longer viable. There are health and safety issues and the protocol for closing a school on health and safety grounds are already in existence and it was really heartening to hear the Permanent Secretary say that they wouldn't be going um, uh, eye to eye with any school over the, the need to close for health and safety reasons. We accept the complexity in regards to closing schools and accept that the initial scientific advice on which that decision, the decision to remain open um, from the UK government, um, it, it, it was reasonable. I would now uh, contend that it is uh, largely out of date and that we need to urgently look at the emerging evidence from the World Health Organization this morning that the, the spread of the virus and what we know about in terms of the spread of the virus is now an exponential curve. Um, and we have talked uh, at length um, about flattening the curve, but to do that, you have to socially isolate. You have to cut down dramatically on social uh, interaction in the whole of society. And there is significant evidence this morning emerging that schools, children are vectors of the virus, not victims of the virus, but they may well become a vector for the very healthcare workers that we're trying to protect with this policy. So, you know, we, we don't, nobody has the, the, the facts on this, but there will be significant numbers of healthcare workers who have children in the primary and post-primary sector that will have children coming home this evening or if they're at school today, <coughs> who may well infect their own parents. Um, so that, that is a really important line to remember. Um, the, the exponential curve modelling, which is really important, and we are asking for the Minister to share with let's face it, the very highly intelligent workforce that makes up our education sector. They will understand this, they will appreciate it, but if every single one of those 340,000 children only touches two adults or two individuals, then you can see how the exponential spread will happen. Um, that has been explained uh, to children very, very uh, well, and you'll have seen some of the, the, the methodologies that's, that, that, that's been used. So, you know, let, give us that so that we can stand over that with our parents. We're only asking for an explanation of the science that has been used to defend the decision to remain open. The social benefits uh, of remaining in school cannot be underestimated. There is no doubt that school, school teachers, school professionals and school leaders want to remain open. They want their children to be in school. You know, they, they do not take these decisions lightly, even, even whenever there is you know, a serious issue in a school not related to, to coronavirus. They agonise over decisions to close schools. However, the educational benefits cannot outweigh the health risks that are currently pre we're presented with. Um, you know, there are a lot of frustrations within the system at the moment. I'm, I'm not going to lie, I've been working 16, 18 hour days over the last five, six, seven days, taking calls from school leaders in total anguish because they're coming under pressure from the, the general public, from parents. They're actually getting serious um, hostile messaging on social media because they don't, you know, they're, they're not seen to be taking a decision in the best interest of the children and young people in the school. But actually, they're following policy guidance. So, you know, there's very little defence for a school leader and obviously then the teachers in the school are getting the same, the same uh, uh, information through to them. You know, we, we want our children, we've been working in the post-primary sector where I am, we've been working really, really hard for years to get our children who are about to sit GCSEs and A-levels to that point. This is the last thing any of us want. However, we are in significant new territory here, so we need to be creative and innovative. And what I want to say to the committee today is that the workforce, by nature, is a creative and innovative group of people. We are solution focused. We've been trained to be solution focused, and we can help the system to come up with innovative ways to mitigate against the risk to our young people. 
and to, the phrase that I have been using is to ensure the continuity of learning for every single child of school going age. We are good at that. Ask us how to help. We will engage with our school leaders and our teachers. All our members that are represented by the NITC will step up and will give you solutions to the problems that you discussed earlier today. Take advantage of that, um, but keep us absolutely in the loop. You know, these, these groups that are being convened at high level, we should be part of that. We are the voice of the workforce. We need to be there so that we can help you to make those decisions and mitigate against the risks of this really frightening situation. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. And uh, we appreciate the Permanent Secretary's willingness to involve uh, trade unions and, and other partners in planning for this. But the big issue at the minute really is fear. Uh, and we believe that fear is bred from a lack of clear information. And the reason some schools are closed and some aren't is really to do with fear, because parents, as Ms Mullen had said, are being told on the one hand society needs to self-isolate, but it's OK to go to school. So the question for parents is, is it OK to go to schools? And, and I have to say the Minister didn't really give us a great deal of clarity. I suspect maybe he can't. Can the Chief Medical Officer? We don't know. But is a school a safe place to go into? And I think uh, Ms Mullen described it very well in a, in a hot house of a classroom and so on. So parents, in, in the absence of clear guidance and clear information on the health front, will vote to be sensible and will have fear. Similarly, and it's been touched on by both Jerry's here, is the position of school principals, obviously from whom uh, our members are drawn substantially. But it just really is not tenable to leave decisions like this to individual schools, because that also breeds uh, fear. Because it was mentioned by one of the members that one school in a town uh, has closed out of fear, responding to the fears of the local community, and another school hasn't responded in the same way and is following the advice. Uh, and then the difference comes in between the two schools. Why is one school <coughs> principal more caring than the other? And they're both caring people. They're all caring people. But we just need clarity of decision, and we need the department to say, are they content that it is safe for children and workers to go into schools at the minute? That, that's the big question, because without answering that, and without certainty on that, you cannot blame parents for voting with their feet, as it has as been described here. Uh, in terms of working, uh, teachers will work very hard, and they already are. Uh, and both Jerry's again have said that there are very, very innovative members of the teaching workforce out there. And we believe the department, and we had some discussions on the side about how those very innovative schools and innovative people could now be mobilised to provide solutions that the department will be searching for. But as we also have to say that you must remember, and the department must remember, teachers are workers as well, and they have the same rights, fears, and they have the same vulnerabilities as everybody else. But the big issue really is communication of the actual facts to remove the fear. Okay, thank you. Would you have advice for the committee and or the minister with regards to a date and an approach to school closure? Well, uh, you know, uh, well, the view of the NITC is that we need to uh, put a date in place um, uh, to close schools. Uh, individual unions have uh, variations of that view, but that is the, the, the overall view. Uh, I think it would be very important that the, the minister would fix a date and fix it right away, you know, for when the schools will close. Uh, for the reasons which he outlined himself, you know, the necessary lead-in time. I think an opportunity was lost here at the beginning of last week, you know, when we had a natural yeah. break, which, you know, which schools have now, you know, taken on board and mm -hmm. extended for themselves. But uh, I think that a reasonable lead-in time um, should be given um, to allow, uh, that would allow the, the uncertainty to be removed. It also, um, allows for you know parents to get the arrangements made around the child minding uh, where where it's needed and for schools to complete the work which they have begun and you know which you know uh, the, they are about uh, for the distance learning over a, a, peri a period a sustained period of time 
And I would add to that by saying that, you know, during the recess, we did have a conversation with the Minister and the Permanent Secretary about the fact that um, there needs to be uh, a little bit of looking at priority pupils, um, those that are taking public examinations. Um, thankfully, at this stage of the year, um, most pupils here in, in year 12 or year 14, 13 and 14 with ASS and A levels, um, will be within you know, a very short time of completing the actual courses that they're going to be examined on. Uh, and so, in a sense, um, giving their teachers time to prep revision packs and so on, which is well underway, I might add, in a lot of schools, giving them time to do that and releasing them from the need to teach other children who are, you know, the urgency isn't the same in regard to preparation for examinations. So that would be very useful. So uh, a setting a date and giving a lead-in time um, as well as giving parents time to prep, but also focusing on priority groups. Um, and so we had mentioned to, um, to the Permanent Secretary about a framework of provision um, for the next few days, um, for the remainder of this week and, and the start of next week, so that schools had a clear view of what their priorities could be in terms of maybe providing hard copy packs of work for younger children and how they, those could be distributed, um, prepared and distributed on an ongoing basis, um, or to address some of the digital inequalities that exist across Northern Ireland in regard to provision of um, connectivity, for example, or access to technology or devices to access technology. So it's imperative that we cannot continue like this. I mean, unfortunately, we're in a situation where we're having a trickle of, of schools that's turning into a torrent of schools that are making decisions to close that are not, they're seen as, as uh, random and ad hoc, and that's not good for the system. You know, it should be, it should be evidence that there is a control and that there is a, a, a cogent reason for the decision to close all schools. Um, so that's really important today. Yeah. Have you received any concerns with regards to the current uh, state of hygiene materials available in all schools? Yeah, we have. Um, we have direct evidence of um, principals phoning us up and saying that. Well, obviously, if, you have, if you're directing children to be washing their hands every 20 minutes and washing them for two rounds of happy birthday, that requires a lot of liquid soap and other sanitising products, never mind paper towels and so on. So yes, schools are running out of these um, key materials to undertake the one mitigating uh, action that they've been told to take over the last few weeks. So um, we, we've lots of incoming on that, and um, the Education Authority have been informed of this and said they were addressing it as recently as yesterday. So hopefully that's the case. Okay. And that's something that we have already agreed to follow up as urgent as well. Have you received specific concerns from special schools or correspondence in relation to at-risk at pupils or teachers? You want to? Yeah. yeah, we absolutely have. Um, obviously, the, they were the first group to raise, raise issues with us because they do have children who fall into all the at-risk groups. Um, they also have children who, who have parents who are, you know, are very concerned and are much, likely, much more likely to contact the school as a, an immediate response about their child's welfare. And that's why you would have seen the 10 Belfast special schools getting together and making a decision to close. Um, I can tell you that today all the special school principals, even of those schools that are closed, are meeting to, uh, as a... Uh, uh, an urgent meeting today, it's actually just started, to dis discuss a way forward in the absence of any decision emanating from um, government today. They will be making a decision because there is now an inequality. You know, there are children in special schools in some parts of Northern Ireland looking at their parents are saying, well, is my child less important and so on. You know, that cannot be allowed to continue. So they will come up with a decision today about the, a more global uh, policy on what's happening with, with children with special needs. But, you know, on a positive note, can I tell you that the work been undertaken by special schools, um, by the staff in special schools, has been inspirational. Um, recording um, video lessons, uh, reading books, reading to children, giving uh, a daily challenge online, you know, giving parents the heads up on how to, you know, de-escalate and mitigate against the, 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 the inevitable uh, cabin fever that will happen with children who have limited capacity to understand um, the reason why their environment has changed and why there's been a sudden change. So there is lots of very, very positive, innovative work to mitigate against the situation that they're in. But that's a very, uh, it's a very good question, and I thank you for asking it. And the, the, the other side of that, of course, is that those children who are vulnerable in other ways, um, 
so th there was some um, addressing of the issue around free school meals, for example. Um, you know, uh, I'm, I'm very uh, pleased to, to, you know, note the minister saying that uh, he wasn't looking at a voucher scheme. We, we, we think that would have been, you know, a disaster had had they had they chosen to go down that route. Uh, we would like to see direct payment made there. We, we think that's the only real way to do it. You know, opening school uh, canteens and bringing in catering staff to prepare meals we don't believe to be sustainable going forward for any length of time. Um, so I, we think it would be much simpler uh, to go down that other route. The other, uh, there's another set of inequalities here we need to be conscious of too, and it, it relates to the distance learning uh, to the distance learning piece, and that, that's around access to appropriate uh, technology in every home for children. Um, you know, it, it, while it is the case that most homes have a smart, you know, have access to smartphones and the like, every home doesn't have one or two iPads, and, and every home doesn't have a laptop uh, available to it. So we we need to be conscious of that. Uh, the, the minister's idea, or the minister's referencing a cocktail of approaches, uh, maybe one way to one way to do that. But, but you know, we're going to have to apply all of those creative faculties, uh, which are available to us across that workforce, um, to to resolving that problem. Uh, 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 the other issue, and it cannot be brushed under the carpet, and, and I heard reference there to the west of the province. It's a province-wide problem here we have with broadband. You know, outside of, of, of many of the large ur urban centres, we have serious um, broadband access issues, um, which you know are going to necessitate um, a fairly a bland cocktail of, of provision, if you like, for those children uh, over the next number of weeks in terms of the, the distance learning options available to them. So there, there are a whole range of issues here. I think also the department will need to engage with trade unions about how we maintain this going forward. The minister or nobody else appears able to give us a time frame here. This could be a matter of weeks, months, or whatever. And I'm conscious uh, online is is fine, and a lot of uh, secondary stage schools might have uh, better e-learning methods and e-learning equipment. But I'm thinking from a primary school background, I, and I was talking to the permanent secretary earlier, but the very youngest children, and we have to respect everybody's learning needs, and this can't be perfect, we get that. But you know, the youngest children can be given packs of work, but they'll tear through it really quickly. And so what is the plan then for maintaining their learning over time. Uh, the online work that older children can do uh, can be sent to them, can be emailed to them, they can pick it up on the internet. But for some of the youngest children, um, th theirs will be more hard copy. Some will be online, of course, and as Jerry says, connectivity will be a problem, but a lot of that will be physical hard copy packs of learning. And how does that get sustained, or does it? So, and I think the only way to do that, the teachers will be the people who um, ultimately will be charged with that responsibility. So engagement with teacher unions on how we maintain children's learning going forward is really important. And I, can't, I kind of feel without a plan for it, um, some things could get lost again between the cracks. So it's an area as well as online work that needs to be considered for our youngest children. They're at the very start of the foundations of their learning. And for a P1 child to stop now might have lost, you know, four fifths or sorry, two fifths of their first year in school. So um, it needs to be. And I know schools are doing fantastic work and producing a lot of work, but that needs to be carried forward. Okay. Deputy Chair, Karen Mill. Thank you so much for coming in. Um, which uh, there's so much going on, and even. I've been describing it. There's more questions than there is answers, and as you go through your question, you, you pull up more. Like yourselves, I'm sitting here. My phone, I can see it going. Principals, um, uh, teachers, reaching out to parents around the whole inconsistency, the messaging, the approach, um, looking for leadership, looking for for uh, clear guidance on it. Um, I suppose just for your, for. Our own party position, um, in case you don't know it, is clear that we, we called for schools to close last week. And we are guided not just on the chief medical officer's uh, medical advice, it's on the World Health Organization, which has de declared this, as Jerry described, a worldwide pan pandemic. 
and on the European Centre for Disease and Prevention and Control, um, and they are calling for early and decisive coordinated implementation of closures are more effective than delayed, and that's what we're basing um, our judgment on uh, is to move now to close schools. I want to apologise again to yourselves, your members and the parents, because I don't believe we got the answers in the previous session. I, I, I'm aware that this is an evolving situation and we may not have them all, but particularly around the advice that we're given in terms of the PHA, if we're following PHA guidance around uh, uh, social distancing, it just doesn't work in schools. And I, I, I put on the record there about my daughter, and I've made that decision just over the weekend, or, or over yesterday, because I'm not sent her in to a, a place where there's a thousand plus people when she's social distancing in all her areas. Um, you mentioned the special schools. We, we had a session last week with special schools principals where they reached out and asked for help, support, and guidance. And they were for, they were left to make that decision in Belfast uh, last Friday, uh, which was totally unacceptable. You know, we are, that's children who are coming with many many underlying uh, health conditions. Parents frantically looking looking to the principal of that school for help and support because it's not common elsewhere. So it's good to hear that as a collective they're meeting today. Um, they're a very powerful group. They have uh, many many. You know, they know they know best, and we had asked last week that that be listened to, and unfortunately it hasn't happened. Um, in terms of the other stuff that, that you said described, the free school meals, and we do have to hear from yourselves. Um, it's good to hear that now that you will be part of the group, but the many different sectors out there. I'm lucky enough to come from a city that has very strong community and voluntary sector, and last week they had already kicked in action plans, meeting every day over the weekend, looking at um, how we can... Um, you know, free school meals. There's many options. We need to uh, go down. I agree with Jerry's proposal. We need to look at homes that don't have the te technology. We need to look at homes who can't afford broadband, and those homes then who don't have broadband because of uh, uh, their not c the connectivity. Um, and we all have. You know, we all have a part to play in that. We need to be part of it and moving forward. Um, I suppose the, the main thing that's coming out, and just from from the contact that I'm getting in the questions, because we tried to put some of them this morning, there's too many, as I say, we put forward, but there seems to be the communication is not, it's either not coming out quick enough, and it's not clear enough to principals that they're, they feel they have to come to politicians saying they ask the questions, they ask the minister. What I just wanted to ask you, are you finding the same from school leaders and board of governors around you know everything. Uh, communication. The first major communication from the department and from EA only arrived. You know, uh, the EA came very late on Friday evening. Yeah. Um, when actually, when the schools were closed on a bank holiday weekend, um, the the ministerial, uh, the depart departmental, sorry, uh, advices were issued on Monday morning. Uh, both of the, well, the EA's advice has been superseded in many respects by events since. For example, the EA advice makes reference to uh, pregnant teachers, um, which has completely been superseded by Boris. Boris's uh, press conference on the Prime Minister's press conference on on Friday. Friday. Uh, the ministerial and departmental advice, which came on Monday, um, we have serious concerns about the nature of that advice. We indeed offered the department. Um, a whole raft of rewording changes, additions to their advice. Now, in fairness to them, um, they've taken all of those away, and we will be we meeting with them again tomorrow. And we're hoping to see some serious revision to the advice which was issued. Uh, but you know, folks, this is a very small place. We all live in it. Um, we all know the pressure that built over last week, but yet it took four days in the case of EA and five or well, seven at the weekend um, on the part of the department.
to issue any guidance of any sort um, apart from look at the PHA website. And if you look at the PHA website and you compare, for example, the PHA, the advice available on the PHA website with, for example, what's available on the HSE website in the Republic of Ireland, you know, the dates around when things have been updated and the scope of the information and the depth of the information available vary quite significantly. And, you know, referring people simply to the PHA website is not going to work no. here. No. Now, we do appreciate this is fast moving, difficult, and, you know, the bureaucracy isn't geared to move this quickly. But I think that that is going to have to change, and it's mm. going to have to change very, very quickly uh, if we're going into a further prolonged period of in engagement with this virus. Can I, can I just add that um, the policy um, in the UK at the minute is not to test. We're not testing. Yeah. We're using um, social distancing and self-isolation as our main drivers for reducing the spread of the virus. However, if you're a school principal, um, as has happened this morning, two calls this morning, um, where you've got presumptive cases in your school, seven in one school, four in another school, and when you phone the 111 line and you're, you're asked, you know, what are the symptoms? Those symptoms can be of a common cold, and the, the advice is still to open your school. Now, the parent, I mean, school teachers are, school uh, head teachers and teachers are caught between a rock and a hard place here in terms of managing um, panic, because if you're the parent of a child in the same class as one of those children, you will know about that child, because that's the way the parent um, WhatsApp groups and so on operate at the moment. Um, and you will not want your child to go to school, and yet the principal seems to be inactive and um, ignoring this by not closing the school. So, the, as I said at the start, Clear, consistent and, uh, uh, guidance is, is essential, but there needs to be an acknowledgement that on a daily basis scenarios will arise yeah. for head teachers that, that will not fit in with the guidance that Jerry has just talked about. Um, you cannot do scenario-based um, ad advice and guidance for this type of situation, and you can't do FAQs for this type of situation because every single day there are new scenarios emerging. So you know, we, we, it, it all leads back to the point, the, the position that we are taking advice from a range of conflicting medical opinions, um, and you know, I, I would reiterate that children in Northern Ireland are no different to children in any other jurisdiction in Europe or beyond Europe. So why, why are our schools still open whenever in, in other jurisdictions the policy has been to close schools? Um, and there is strong evidence to say that that does flatten the curve. And also, children in Northern Ireland are no less able to cope with the rigours of being at home in a, in, a, in a very unusual situation than children in France, Spain, Italy or anywhere else. You know, that there is a, a degree of having to manage you know, we will mitigate and we will try to, you know, maintain continuity of learning, but we have to accept that there is a responsibility in every single person to manage this situation. Okay. Robbie, is that okay? Yeah. Robbie Butler. Um, thank you for your time. Um, thank you for your articulate presentation of, of, uh, of the facts as, as you and, and the rest of us will see them. And I think it's, um, and, and you, you, you all did allude to the fact that, um, there's a lot of information out there. There's a lot of expert information, and, and, and how people are interpreting it can even be different, different within the scientific medical circles. And those are the experts who are dealing with those facts and, and the curves and the flat line and, and all of the things that we're talking about. And, and it is so difficult to get it right. But I, I think what you guys have done today is you've made a compelling case for, for, you, for your members. And it was nicely said out at the start, Jerry, in terms of your priorities, people's safety, and the health and the health and well-being of teachers, which are inextricably linked. The other thing that, uh, that I particularly liked was the, the, the willingness um, for your members then to be part of the uh, innovative approach to maintaining some level of, of educational provision um, wherever our kids are going to be. Um, and I do hope, and, and there's probably just a difference of opinion on how we interpret the Minister's position here. I think we're rapidly moving to the point where your intervention overnight is probably <coughs> going to expedite uh, that, that, that data. I don't know, I'm not prejudging it, but I, I certainly hope we are moving um, towards that, guys. Um, in terms of um, also, um, and we've talked a lot about the children today, and I'm not moving them to the side, but I'm going to talk about the teachers here, because that's who you're here to represent. So the pressures that they have been under recently, 
Um, what steps uh, should we be thinking about taking or, 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 or as politicians to support our teachers' mental health and wellbeing as well? Because they will have that. So if we extend the rule or change the rule in any, in any way for this next... Uh, there was only one thing Sorry, I disagreed with. I think it's, it's pretty much uh, well covered now that the length of time this is going to be is 14 to 16 weeks minimum. We're not talking... We've never really, to be fair, I've never heard about the two weeks. It's always been 14 to 16 weeks minimum. Which only takes us to the other side of the summer holidays when we get that. Um, and what, what do you suggest then in terms of what support we can we can give to our teachers to support our pupils, um, particularly with regard to their own resilience um, and any capacity that they might need and resource they might need to fulfil that function? I'm happy to take that if you want. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we've had a lot of discussions about about this recently, and um, my daughter's a teacher, and I know a lot of newly qualified teachers as well with my work with PGC students. Um, the, they are very resilient people, particularly whenever they are allowed to congregate in, in groups, whether that be a virtual group. Um, so, in terms of hubs for provision for um, exam classes, you know, sharing the load in terms of providing online resources for exa um, public examination preparation, that's the type of thing that they're very, very good at. And being part of a a, a global group that are all focused on learning continuity will help, will mitigate against the impacts of isolation for teachers. Um, but we have to give them the facility to, to have that framework. We have to actually allow them time to get together in groups and cross you know, all the English teachers, all the history teachers, all the geography teachers, all the key stage one teachers. They've all got things to offer and we need to give them the mechanism to be able to, to, get, to get together and do that. And there is great strength in that. Um, teachers are very, very dedicated to their pupils and will find this incredibly stressful. There's no doubt about it and we need to be really mindful of that in terms of communicating effectively with them on a regular basis. That's just that's not just school leaders but all the professionals here in, in supportive schools, all the stakeholders. Um, that, that's going to be key to the whole the whole thing. But allowing them to get together in, in, in hubs, for want of a better word, within a framework of support so that they are not all producing resources in isolation, that if there is continuity of online provision or hard copy packs needing to be provided, that there's a sharing of good practice going on within the, the, the population of teachers <coughs> and, and support staff. And we're, we're very happy to get involved in that, in that type of work. Can I say, in terms yeah. of teachers' mental health, Robbie, I think it's important whatever instructions, directions, guidance comes out <clears throat> gives cover to school principals and the teachers. Um, I, I have to say, uh, health workers, I find, in the media are regularly praised by their department. Mm -hmm. And this morning I was encouraged to hear all of you. Thank you for praising the teachers. I actually don't often hear that publicly. Mm. And what has begun to happen with the fear factor and people going their own way is that teachers become compared on social media, schools become compared mm -hmm. on social media. That erodes teacher confidence. It erodes teachers' health and wellbeing. And so, therefore, any guidance coming out must be very clear so that parents and the young people using the education service are very clear and they understand how much their teachers and their school principals are doing for them, because that's very rarely ever said. And the other yeah. thing I think which would be important, uh, Mr Butler, would be that uh, in providing the distance learning and producing the material which you know will be made available to the children and young people to take away with them when the schools eventually do close, um, that consideration is given, you know, to the caring responsibilities, as I said earlier, of the teachers themselves, and that you know account is taken, and expectations are managed around what can we, we can reasonably expect of those teachers, you know, given that they're not going to be in that closed school environment, they're going to be in their own home, dealing with their own children, and possibly you know supporting or assisting others, you know. Who, who, who require to be looked after in the community or in their own home. So, you know, there is going to be big challenges uh, for teachers' mental health and well-being posed by this, but as my colleague said here, they're extremely resilient, they're extremely down-to-earth, and, you know, we will get through this, as we all will, and uh, we will come out the other side, and hopefully we'll be all in a better place. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Robin Newton. Uh, thank you, Chair, and uh, welcome to the delegation. And just lest there be any doubt, there is a huge value placed on uh, teachers uh, and the educationists uh, as a whole, uh, right across the board. 
I want to kind of ask some, uh, I think, fairly simple questions. I think it was you, Mr. Gregg, who raised the problem initially about communication. I is it communication of information or is it the communication channels that, that are uh, not working properly? I think the uh, channels are there. If we're going to ask it then, uh, yeah, I, I think the, 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 the piece on the, uh, the direct payment uh, for the school meals, if you could maybe just outline how that might work, as you, and that's your preferred uh, way rather than meals being delivered to, uh, am I right? Have I picked that up correctly? Yeah. Uh, well, yeah. uh, yes, it is my preferred methodology, if you like. I, I can I just then, uh, and the other one, and I raised it with the Minister and Mr Baker when they were here, I have a great concern about those children who are it's not a term I like, but they're described as underachievers, and I do feel that, and I've seen it in schools in my own constituency where significant progress has been made, and that these children are in danger of, in fact, as Mr. Baker used the expression, of falling through the gap in this situation, not having the support of the teacher, the school, the infrastructure of the school around it. Uh, in this uh, situation, so. Well, maybe if I could take the last one first and then pass across to Jerry. I totally agree with you, and I think it, it's, it behoves all of us to make sure that the most vulnerable and the, 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 those children who have barriers to their learning anyway don't have further barriers put in their way. So it, it, it'll be incumbent on all the services, not just education services, but health, health and social care as well, to come forward with creative methods for supporting those children. And in, in, many, in many ways, this presents us with an opportunity to get very creative around those, those, that particular vulnerable group. Um, and then that's, that's the, the, my background, is dealing with children who have very, very severe adversity in their lives and for whom going to school every day is a massive achievement in itself. So, you know, I, I would welcome um, the opportunity to work in partnership with the other agencies that are supporting those children and young people. I see no reason why, with all the, the innovative um, technology we have these days, that counselling couldn't uh, be maintained online, providing those children have access. Um, and that is a serious issue that I do think that this committee, you know, could take forward for us in terms of access. And um, you know, I have heard about uh, lending schemes for children, you know, in terms of being able to take school iPads home with them for this period of time, yeah. and so on. So that maybe needs to be explored even further. But that still might not address the connectivity issues in yeah. terms of being able to access um, a reasonable signal in parts of Northern Ireland. But um, I think that's about partnership. Um, that that is about. Fi finally actually getting to the point where there's a holistic, joined up approach to supporting the most vulnerable learners. And we've been saying it for years, and there, here's an opportunity now to put our money where our mouth is and actually make sure that those children get phone calls to the home, they get the extra um, resource uh, if they need to borrow technology and so on, that that is put in place and they are prioritised. But I agree with you, and I think uh, Harry alluded to it earlier, you know, if we interrupt the learning of a child with disadvantage, they will be doubly disadvantaged. And so we're very conscious of that. And uh, I mentioned to Chris earlier, we want to be innovative. We want to be supportive in any way and contributing to any committee or think tank about how that can be taken forward. The willingness is there. I can pick up on your point about communication. I, I think the channels are there. I think it's more to do with the timeliness and the quality of information that's sent out. And I think it those sending the information out would do well to consider before they send it, how will this be received? Is this going to be useful to people? And actually, you know, we're very well placed to advise them on that. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't take much to pre-contact to mm -hmm. say, look, we're thinking of sending this out. Would this be useful? What problems would that cause in the yeah. system? Because sometimes, honestly, information is sent out very well-meaning. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of work's gone into it and it's sent out. But when it lands uh, on the front line in schools, it can be difficult to implement, it can be confusing. So it's not a difficult thing to pre-consult on, we're going to send this out, what do you think? I think my colleagues would appreciate Absolutely. it. Okay. In respect to, the, to, to free school meals and, and how they would be provided, uh, or not provided, but the provision would be maintained, if you like, um, 
I would very strongly advocate that it's done by direct payment. I think that, you know, the mechanism the mechanism should be relatively straightforward. It can be either by direct payment to the household, probably managed through, I don't know, the Department of Communities possibly, a benefit system or whatever. Um, but these, these children are already known, you know, and I think you'll find that these children are known to one or two departments. So, you know, we know where they are. It's a question of, of, of putting or getting the resource, the money, in this case, to the to their carers um, directly and as quickly as possible. Uh, there might even there might even be a, a saving here to be had. You know, I know this is you know <laughs> perhaps inappropriate to be talking about savings at this time, but there actually might be an administrative saving here, and uh, this might be a more effective way to do it than we're currently doing it anyway. Okay. Okay, sure. Yep. Justin McKelty. Thank you, Chair, and <clears throat> thank you, Harry, uh, Jerry, and Jerry for coming before us today. I know you also are very busy and trying to manage this ever-changing situation. Um, I applaud your coolness and your calmness and your consistency of messaging unified decision-making um, in the circumstances that's very important, and I think that's also reflected in the teaching body in terms of the principals, teachers, staff, who are pillars in our community and who I can't stress strongly enough how important it has been, how they have remained calm, how they've made cool and calm decisions and been leaders in their communities. And that's massively important in this context. Um, from your perspective, if the Minister doesn't act now, if the First Minister and the Deputy First Minister don't act now, and give clear, unambiguous messaging around the schedule for closing schools, which has to happen from this point in terms of to pupils and in terms of provisions for uh, planning lesson plans and uh, book work for kids at home, offline and online. What will be the outcome of that? Well, I, I, I think the outcome is already manifesting itself, uh, Mr McNulty. Um, schools are closing. Principals on boards of governors are carrying out risk assess assessments, and they are concluding that you know it's in the best interests of the children and young people and, and uh, those who work in the schools that they be closed. Um, so you know, I, I think it, in the absence of any clarity moving forward, you're going to see more of that. Um, you know, it must be quite difficult sitting in the Department of Education looking at a system where, in effect, which is increasingly out of your control, um, you know. Uh, so they will move forward, uh, more schools will close, but teachers and principals and school leaders will continue to prepare and manufacture and upload all of those materials which will be used to support distance learning over a prolonged period, going, you know, over the 14 to 16 week period which has been talked about. Mm -hmm. Um, we have to remember that um, given the ad medical advice um, and the new social distancing uh, advice in terms of, or self-isolation advice in terms of anybody in your home having a call for a temperature, that will impact on the workforce in schools. And I alluded to earlier the protocol for assessing the viability of remaining open in terms of being safe. We had schools yesterday where there were 20 plus staff off ill genu in genuine uh, situations. Um, so that's not viable. That's not a situation where a school is, is safe to remain open. So the Permanent Secretary mentioned that there were a number of those applications going in from school principals and chairs of governors for legitimate closure on grounds of health and safety. So Mr McNulty, you'll see more of that. Mm -hmm. And it would be so much better if we could do this in a controlled way with a cogent argument as to why we're doing it. I think just in terms of advice we would give to our members, the scenario you paint there um, brings up the idea of a level of risk. Without guidance, without a decision, then each school, principal, board of governors, each group of teachers is trying to manage the, a risk. What, what, what risk would be deemed appropriate? None. So in those circumstances where we were being asked for advice, we would have to advise our members, and we'll make no bones about it, don't take any percent of risk. Yeah. That's exactly what we're saying to people. 
Yeah. Yeah. Surely so. Yeah. Um, have you been consulted, consulted um, in terms of what the Minister mentioned in relation to child care contingency planning? No, um, we haven't. Uh, and I would imagine that's one of the things that we will be seeking to discuss with the departmental officials and the employing authorities tomorrow. Uh, there, you know, back to Ms. Mullins' earlier question around, you know, is it a workforce issue or is it a health issue? The minister said quite clearly that it was a health issue, but then, sort of, and as he talked his way through it, backtracked again. You know, so uh, that's a confusion I think which we need clarified. Um, I would like to hear what what they have in mind, I, but then I would like to see a broader plan as well, uh, you know. Uh, but you know, let's see what they have to say. And I'm, I'm uh, you know, as I said at the very beginning here, we're here to help. You know, we're here to, to contribute um, in everybody's interests, particularly in the interests of our members, of course, the children and young people. So let's hear what they have to say about that in some detail, and then we'll be able to comment more fully on it, I think. Yeah. I think it, it is important to note, though, that the childcare arrangements, the, there's been a wee bit of um, pressure put on schools to remain open simply because of the, the childcare facility that they provide by dint of the fact that children are there every day. Um, is that a, a good enough reason, given the medical advice that this curve is now exponential? Um, there, there is some advice that would say that children going home to or being minded by grandparents will increase the risk to grandparents. Mm -hmm. That is only the case if they are okay. socially yeah. mixing. Yeah. If they're socially isolating, well, then the risk is minimised. So I'm not sure that argument holds up. But it, you know, currently, you know, rough estimate is that 40% of children who should be at school are not at school yesterday yeah. and today, um, and those children are clearly being cared for somewhere. Um, and we have to accept as a society that there will be in, uh, parents who will not be at work as a result of this and that there may well be innovative ways in which childcare can be provided. But as Jerry said, it would be interesting to see and hear those discussions. Okay. Um, if, have you any guidance or steer for staff who are booked for substitute cover or temporary contracts between now and June, and will they still be paid? The, the, the one good thing in terms of communication which has emerged from all of this is that there is very detailed guidance um, available to, to substitute and temporary teachers. Um, it did issue as a link, it was buried in the information which um, EA put out to schools on Friday evening. Uh, it's currently available, I believe, on all of the mm -hmm. union's websites. But I suppose the headline here is that if a temporary or substitute teacher is booked to do work, they will be paid for that work even if the schools are closing. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, uh, the people who, 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 who will find themselves in difficulty here are the casual substitute teachers, those who are employed only on a daily basis. And, and we're, we are going to have to work out something around that. But then that's a broader, that's a huge workforce issue, you know, more broadly. And I, I will be back here before the end of the week with another hat on me um, as president of the Irish Congress of Trade Unions. And the issue of casual work, gig economy and all of that will yeah. feature very strongly in that discussion. Okay, thank you. And I welcome very much your commitment to help, to innovate to find solutions and that's going to be very important in the weeks and months ahead and I want to wish you well. I want to wish you well and your members well during this crisis we're all in the midst of now so best of luck. Thank you. Thank you. Catherine Kelly. Thank you so much for coming here today. Um, absolutely everything that you have said about um, the fears of teachers and principals and school staff is exactly what I've been hearing over the past couple of days in particular. Um, it seems that uh, Boris Johnson is making a decision on school closures imminently. Um, so the decision might already have been made um, by him before we, we leave this room. Um, but on that, I just want to commend, I have no questions, it's just I want to commend the work of yourselves and the principals and teachers out there who are seriously stressed at this time. Um, and I don't envy their, their position at, at the moment. Um, they have children at the centre of, of their everything. 
um, and possibly um, to the, the detriment of their, of their own health and mental well-being, um, which Robbie mentioned earlier. But thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thanks very much indeed for coming here. I think I gave you about 12 hours notice maximum further <laughs> yesterday. It was, you, it was we, we might us, be actually. able to facilitate you. I think I confirmed at about 9 a.m. this morning. Yes. So I, thank, thank you, you so much. Anyway, well, thank you very much thank for the you. opportunity. Yeah. Yeah. Thank very much appreciate can it. I, can I thank say just guys. in closing as well, um, it, we, we, we have reached a, an untenable situation here today that hopefully will be urgently resolved. But the contingency provisions around special school medication provision, around childcare, around free school meals, distance learning, examinations, staff pay, still need to be worked out. I think we made some progress today in our engagement with the Minister around engagement with stakeholders that we have been reassured on a number of occasions in this Assembly that was happening. It, it clearly wasn't to the extent that it should have been, and hopefully it will now be, because as a number of members have alluded to, and I want to be the overriding message coming from this committee today, we are wholly committed to working together to minimise the worst effects of this virus on children and young people and people across Northern Ireland, and to maintain educational continuity in so far as we physically can. So please consider us um, regular contact and if we can help in any other way with the work that you need to do to contribute to that contingency provision then please let us know. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Chris. Thanks. Um, thank, thank you. Thanks for having the committee. Thanks. Yeah. Okay, members, we are uh, just about maintaining quorum. <laughs> um, so, uh, no problem. Boris Johnson has told MPs to prepare for imminent closure of schools. Right, OK. So maybe that may direct okay. the well, Minister hopefully, here. Hopefully we will get some urgent clarity around that then. <laughs> um, members, thank you for your application today on a serious uh, range of issues. We have um, the clerk to update us on any actions coming from our previous briefing there, Clark. Yeah. So, Chairperson, since we're just on our quorum, do members want to write also to the department and ask them to provide a helpline? Um, now, we've, members have asked about it, but are they now asking for them to do it? Rather, because as they indicated there, um, the guidance doesn't cover every situation. FAQs aren't going to cover every situation. I think maybe the I Deputy asked Chair asked me that before. I asked him a couple yeah. of times to do it, right. so yes. Do that again. Great. I think that's a great. And also, are the committee then asking to see the model? Yes. Um, yep. Yeah. Yes, agreed. Yeah. Agreed. And finally, are you asking about... Um, uh, the department to clarify around access and connectivity issues so when there are parts of Northern Ireland where they don't have uh, broadband what will we do uh, for uh, children's ongoing education in the event of the closure of schools yes I, I, I think this I think this committee has a body of work to do here I, I am yeah. slightly concerned but the, the the areas for contingency are well known the stage of readiness that the department appears to be at on these contingencies is is concerning. Um, if we if we need to meet outside of a Wednesday meeting, if we need to call people back more regularly, I'm content to do that if members are as well. But that we, we know what the key areas are, and maybe that that's what we can include in correspondence as well. Clark is is what what's what is the current readiness in relation to you know children with special educational needs, medical and health provisions, childcare provision, free school meals, distance learning, examinations and staff pay. I, I think those are the key so issues in the round to, can, to ask for regular updates from the, the There was the, the bit that also we talked about that the kind, they were looking mental at the health provision as well. Yeah. And, yeah. yeah. Okay. So, so Chair, as, as members will recall, the Permanent Secretary set out the five areas yeah. mm. Mm. and um, what we previously agreed was to seek sight of the SITREP, so the SITREP yep. is a situation report. Okay. That won't be extra work for the Department, they'll be doing that anyway. Yeah. Uh, it's something that will go right the way up to the Permanent Secretary and the Minister, and if they just would share it with the Committee, that will answer, I would yep. have thought, all of your questions. Yep. Yeah. Can I also, do if I'm in order here or not, Clark, but I think we ought to 
urgently hear from the childcare sector in Northern Ireland. And I don't know what our schedule is for next Wednesday. Everything is contingent now, but if members are agreed, I think we should factor in a, an urgent briefing from the childcare sector. Boys for childcare, early years organisation. Uh, yeah, I can add detail to that, but yeah. Okay, well, I suspect Wednesday, next Wednesday at the latest. Is there a body before. for the private? Is yeah, yeah, we can include that as well. Yep. Yep. Can we maybe get an update from the youth services sector? Youth services, yeah. yeah. Okay. Sorry, Clark. Okay. No, um, I suspect our forward work program may, may need to change. To revision. Yep. Yes. Yep. <laughs> so it will. So yep. There we go. Okay. Correspondence then, Clark. Yep. yep. So, Chair, do you want me to drive? Please do. Okay, so um, at 7.1, you have an index of uh, all of the correspondence. There is a bit. Um, 7.2, page 332, is a response from the Department regarding holiday hunger. Um, so, the Department references free school meals, the importance of a joined up approach, doesn't indicate a way forward. Mm. Um, and remember, it, I've raised that before. Do you want to note this for now, and I guess we will return to this again? Yeah. Yep. Okay. Yep. Really good. So, um, likewise, 7.3 suggesting we simply note 7.4. This is a question which uh, Mr. Butler actually asked about the exclusion of children from GCSE statistics. They have come back. So, the exclusion from statistics doesn't include the school leader survey. So, it doesn't affect the programme for government. But they haven't answered on the question about trends in GCSE exclusions. These had increased. Um, I think it was like 2012. There was some talk about it being more in some sectors than others. So that might still be an interesting thing to follow up on if members are content. Yes, so it doesn't affect the programme for government. Um, right. Then there's uh, Action for Children, seeking a meeting for the committee. I think the idea here is maybe we will invite them to the Emotional Health and Wellbeing event, whenever that actually is. Okay. Mm -hmm. No, okay. in tabled papers, this will be in your electronic pack because it's so huge. Um, the Education Authority came back about youth sector provision. Um, they provided us with about, I think it's 24 papers. I've read them. Mm -hmm. um, I suggest, Chairperson, maybe the committee wants to write again to the Education Authority and actually require them to provide summarised answers, particularly on the particular question which members asked about uh, inclusion and fairness in respect of the new funding stream consultation. Because I don't know that that has particularly answered that. There are also things in here. I've been the clerk since 2012, and there are things I wasn't aware of. So there's stuff like start, I hadn't heard about. And I think an evaluation of that is there's an interim and there's a further one coming our way. There's also stuff around, um, well, the things related to that which the committee has never dealt with. So. Um, I'm suggesting that uh, maybe we write to the Education Authority, seek sight of the start final evaluation, and then maybe um, add that to the forward work programme. Do members okay. want to do that? Okay, yep. I want to do that. Agreed. Yep, mm -hmm. agreed. Agreed. Okay, yes. Um, so then, also in tabled items, um, we would have dealt with this if we'd been talking about the special educational needs today. There's a response from um, the department just in terms of the Education Authority audit findings. So, look, I anticipate that we'll see the Education Authority, I hope, on the 1st of April, and uh, the Chief Executive and maybe the Chairperson of the uh, Education Authority Board to come back on all of this so we can pick that all up there. And it's like the Deputy Chair had indicated there's a lot to talk about and not to just rush through. So we'll just note that for now, if members are happy. Great. Great. Joint good, joint good. So, um, then, Going all the way down, 7.8, it's a letter from Arma. Uh, this is page 373, Arma Bambridge Craig Alvin Primary Principals Group. This is about the Anti-Bullying, uh, Addressing Bullying in Schools Act. Uh, this hasn't been commenced yet. Um, they've raised a few concerns. Suggest we just write to the department and seek a response on the issues raised. Um, and that's something, again, that will take a little bit more consideration, Chairperson. Agreed. If members agreed. Uh, agreed. Then at Page 400, yeah, fresh start. Department has provided further information on the estimated timing and projected expenditure of the fresh start projects. So they provided information, I think, for 17. And if you add it all up, that comes to 295 million pounds. Um, but what's missing from that are, well, the balance. So there's 470 to play with, but 170 million not there. And it's, it's what the department explains that uh, the business cases for these uh, other projects are subject to review. These include Strule, uh, but also integrated schools at Slemish, Park Hall, Dungannon, Drumran, Hazelwood. 
Um, so again, I don't think there's a, a particular action at this point. It's just for members to note that um, quite a lot of money to play with in terms of fresh start, 470 million. They've accounted for 300 million and what their plan is, and you can see how they're going to do that over a couple of years. But there's still a few things in the air, e.g. Struhl, and I still don't know that we have confirmation from HM Treasury that they're going to allow the department to reprofile the underspends from the previous year. So that's a sort of holding response. Okay. Um, just for members to note if they're content. Okay. And then, sure. uh, sorry, need, sorry. I need a comfort break. No problem. I'm going to stop for a second then. Shall we just, uh, no problem, yep. We'll just, uh, push the program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly, Senate Chamber, program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Thanks, Chairperson. Okay, members. We so resume. Resuming then at page 403 is correspondence from the Department on menstrual well-being in schools. Um, the Minister also received a copy of the initial correspondence. Uh, he's responded directly to the correspondent. Um, they've, they've indicated um, that CIA have been engaged to, um, to, to look into the, the issues raised, but they've also said that uh, what I didn't know is in 2018, CIA was commissioned to review relationship and sexuality education resources. Yeah. It hadn't noticed, so members could then just to write to CIA about that and maybe we'll ask for a briefing yeah. sometime mm. um, on that. Yes. Agreed. Right, okay, then at page 414, correspondence from um, Stramilla Centre for Research in Educational Underachievement asking to brief on its work on the DE cutting funding to SCOTENS, which is the cross border standing conference on teacher education in North and South. Content to take that. Content, agreed, yeah. Great, very good. Then at page 425, it's an invitation from Access Employment Limited in Lorne to see the work of its transitions programme, so members content for us to schedule that. When yep. appropriate, yep. Point, agreed, yes. yep. Very good. And that, unless members have any other points, um, or uh, the key correspondence, there okay. is something about independent counselling services as well. They've come back with uh, uh, an update on the um, wait lists, uh, which members had asked. Okay. But maybe back on that. And review that. Okay. Members have any further comments on correspondence or content to process it in that way? Yep. Yep. 
Okay, members agenda item 8 is forward work program, which is extremely fluid at this moment in time, open to adjustment. One key issue is the visits that were scheduled. Clark, do you want to speak to that? So, Chairperson, perhaps it um, <coughs> may not be the best time to visit schools, particularly mm. if, they're, well, if they may be closed, as the member had indicated. Um, so what I'm suggesting then is that all of the visits, external events and informal meetings, even bringing people into the building, that maybe we just um, suspend those for now and come back, come back at another time. If members yeah. are happy to do that. Yeah, I don't think we've any other option. No, we've no other option other than to yeah. advise, schedule school visits of likely suspension of those, um, and and to address our business to core business around the response to coronavirus and the contingency planning at this stage. Yeah. Maybe that chair. I think that the deputy deputy secretary, the um, permanent secretary, was hinting there that the department may struggle to answer mm. our correspondence or come out and brief yeah. us on other matters. So mm. um, I'll work with the DALO and uh, we'll rejig the uh, forward work program and, as the chair has indicated, um, focus on the things that need to be focused on. I'll be led by members. I think that makes sense, yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay, members, any other business? Okay, our next scheduled meeting is Wednesday the 25th of March, 9.45am in room 30. Okay, and if, if there are ongoing or emerging issues that members feel that the committee should respond to, I think we will have to be agile and, and nimble to respond to some of those. Feel free to come through the clerk or myself on those matters. Okay, thank you. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly.